Hi, guys. Hey, Ira. Hi, hi, Dexter. Hope you're well. I'm mostly going to be listening today, so. Um, oh, really? I thought you had a spot on the agenda. Yeah, Nisa's on the agenda, I think, specifically, so. Oh, hi, Susan. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You can unmute yourself. I did. How are you? Good. Good. Any relation to Jessica? Yes, is my daughter. You know Jessica? Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, there are two. <laughs> Funny. Uh, there are two Jessica Coslos. My daughter, who. Oh. And, and then uh, there's a Jessica Coslo who is a chef and owns like restaurants. Yes, that's the Coslo. one we know. And uh, yeah, and they work together at the LA, um, the LA paper. The not, not, what is it? The. Uh, my brain's going, but anyway, uh, <laughs> not not LA Times. They worked for the LA um, the LA Weekly, no, Daily News. LA Weekly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, and Jessica was doing uh, hip hop reviews, and the other Jessica was doing food stuff. And mm -hmm. then <laughs> their middle names are the same too. It's so weird. Uh, mine is N A N N, and and the other one is A N A N N E. <laughs> so they kept getting uh, checks. So they, they met each other because they, they would have to meet to return checks. Oh, that's really funny. And, and, and what just a small world. <laughs> that's so funny. Where do you know Jessica well, from? Um, I, well, I know the food Jessica. Um, oh. I don't remember. <laughs> she and my husband somehow knew each other a long time, many years ago. Um, yeah, that's how we well, know it. She just had a lot of trouble, I guess, with mold on jelly or something. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Gotta be careful. You know what? I'm going to step away just for a oh, moment. Sure, I sorry. will be back. Sure. I'm going to check. Hi, Nancy. See. Oh, solid that is stuck outside. All right. Hi, Susan. I was having a little trouble with my audio, so... <laughs> Okay. Hi, Soledad. That's good. Hi, I will make Hi, you. Hi, um, um, Soledad. I see you. I've been emailing. <laughs> um. Um, and I wanted you. to Soledad. I just wanted to. Um. I wanted to mention that we actually will have um. Our regional health officer, Dr. Joining us, she was able to clear her schedule at the last minute, um, and she'll be she'll be joining. If we can make her um, a panelist, that would be great. Um, and she'll actually be um, she'll probably join in, in a few minutes, or maybe even after the meeting starts, and she'll be available for Q and A at the end. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you guys go first, and we've gotten a bunch of comments and questions just from residents. So we'll probably ask you everything then, because then we're going to move on to different, you know, more yeah. uh, safety stuff. Yeah. So we'll get everything done, you know, in that time. But that's awesome. Yeah. 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 So she, she should be, as soon as I see her pop up, I'll let you know. Um, okay. And that way. We'll uh, do, can you see the attendees? What's her name? I can. Yeah. Her name. So her name's Sylvia Pieto. Um, so once she joins, um, okay. we can, we can. Oh, you don't see it right away. Uh, but. If I'm still here, you can let me know. Uh, although, um, what happened to, oh, Soledad. Soledad's a co-host and she can do everything. She can let people change okay. and Perfect. what they need to do. Sorry, that was uh, another committee member. <laughs> um, and so Ira, so you've made me a co-host. Yeah, um, that means you can do everything. Okay, perfect. Cause we had, uh, we had four members take a Zoom training. So we think we're ready for this. All right, good. Well, yeah, and you can. I don't. I don't know if you. You can. I don't know if you can make co-host, but I, I, when I, if I lead, you'll be host. So then you can do everything. 
Hey, Sola, Dad. Hi there. Excited? I would say in general, such a busy agenda. Um, I'm going to try to keep as quiet as I can, but if, if you need anything or want anything, just give me a little bump. Okay, perfect. And Ira, you know, I don't see that I'm a, a co-host yet because I don't see the ability to add another co-host. Well, I, if I leave, I'll make you host. I mean, okay. if you want me to leave now, I'll leave. I thought it would just- No, uh, just, uh, can you make me co-host? <laughs> <a> uh, <laughs> no, if I, as soon as I'm not host, I can't do anything. Okay. So I'll be host. Co-host can do everything, I guess, but make other co-hosts. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't had that because uh, when I leave, I make the chair or the co-host the host. Then, then you can do everything. Oh, Mark is in attendees. Lisa is attendee. Joey Buckets. That's funny. I wonder if he's the poker buckets. Uh, uh, Gussie, Gloria Romero, Dr. Pete Damon, CJ. Hi, CJ. Chantel and Angela. <laughs> Nisi, you look really angry. Good. Keep it up. Sorry. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Unless you're talking about that guy, he's not so happy. No, no. Uh, Lonnie? Is Lonnie Resser somebody? He put initials after his name. He's uh, my colleague, actually. She's also a representative from the Department of Public Health. Oh, so I can make him a panelist, I guess. What do you want? Tell her that. Sorry? You can make panels. Uh, Lani Restner is from the Department of Public Health. Do you want these people as? Yes, because uh, she's presenting. Right okay. She's joining yeah. you, Nancy. Actually, the only person that will be presenting with me will likely be uh, Dr. Dr. Prieto, um, who I see it has joined, so she can be made. Dr. A Prieto. Yes. Yeah. She'll be uh, she'll be handling the Q and A. So if we can make her a panelist, that would be great. Go Q and A. Okay. Oh, there. I was able to unmute myself now. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Dr. Fitz. Can't see you. <laughs> Let's see. So we're missing a few um, of our committee members. So we're waiting on. But do you have a, a do you have a quorum? No. Not I'm yet. Like We're all, I think that there's just an issue with the, the Zoom link. So let's just give them a second to join in. Sure. Well, I was relating to what you could do, not what you had to do. <laughs> okay. Oof. Oh, Eva Green is a, a, a panelist too. Okay, great. Let's bring her in. Okay. Susan, it's so nice of you to uh, pull these uh, experts together for us. I'm really looking forward to My uh, pleasure. Looking forward to the My conversation. Pleasure. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good, good dialogue. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to do so. Oh, Alan Parsons, he's on the committee too, right? Right, I just brought him in. Let's see. Oh, you did, good. Oh, see, great. So, and, and Ms. Rodriguez is also with you, Susan? Ms. Rodriguez is with you? Yeah, we yeah. have um, Nancy, Lonnie, um, Dr. Silvia Prieto, and- Oh my goodness. Lindsay, Lindsay's and actually Lindsay. on as well. I a saw real, her name. Real, oh, great. Real wealth of experts here. Wow. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think we have everyone now. Um, let's see. 
yeah, where I think we're all here. So, wow, 502, we made it. Um, and so what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to mute everyone so that we can get through this. Uh, we just, so everyone, thank you for coming. This is our very first meeting for our committee. Uh, a bunch of us just did a Zoom training. Uh, we feel like we are staffed and we're prepared for this, but please bear with us as you know, it's our first time. Uh, but we are dedicated to making this worthwhile. And again, my name is Solad Sua. I am the chair of the newly formed Public Health and Safety Committee. And let's see. So, okay. So uh, we're going to do a call to order and roll call. Um, so I've never done this before. So I'm here. I'm Solad Sua. Uh, Eva Green, are you here? I'm here. Okay. Uh, John, are you here? Wiginski? Same. John needs to unmute himself. Now he's disappeared. Mm -hmm. All right, hopefully he will call back in. Uh, Helen Fellon, are you here? Is that a yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, she's there. Okay. Uh, Ellen Parsons. Present. Okay. Mark Ryvek. Here. Okay, and then we're waiting on John to join back in. But I did, I just talked to him a second ago. Um, are we okay to move on then since we know everybody's here? It looks like LAPD Pacific area is part of the attendees group. I don't know if they're supposed to be part of the panelists or not. Yeah, there you go, but where, oh, they mean the phone numbers? Or what's the names? Uh, LAPD Pacific area. Oh yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank you. And we are recording FYI, right? Yeah. Okay. There they are. Um, okay, so I guess, oh, so now uh, I would like to approve this agenda. Do we have everybody's approval? Do you have a second? Uh, Oh. So did that. Do you want to screen share your agenda? Yes, you're right, Ira. Thank you. Oh, God. Hold on. Hmm. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> See this? Great. This is where we are. So, okay. So, Eva, you just seconded my uh, motion to approve the agenda. Yes, I did. Okay, uh, are we gonna take a vote on to approve it? Does anybody object? Can we all vote yes to approve? Yes. Yes, oh, okay, good, everybody's back. So are, are we good to move on? Yeah, when you get to motions, <clears throat> you should do, <clears throat> excuse me, a roll call vote generally if you have motions. This type of stuff with approving the agenda, yeah, you can just say, uh, uh, does everybody approve? And then make sure that uh, if someone, you know, you put down the correct vote, mm -hmm. uh, you can have people not approve and still approve the agenda, you know, as long as it's a majority. But. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. So okay. now we are at, you know, uh, the chair report. Uh, I just, I wanna thank everyone for making this happen. Uh, you know, we're here to represent you. Uh, we, you know, we want to open into, you know, a discussion on how to provide the public health and safety for everyone in Venice. And we're talking the entire population. You know, one thing that we've talked about is we've questioned, you know, what is the total population of Venice? Because we are such a different hybrid of any kind of neighborhood out there where we have, you know, we have residents, we have permanent residents here. We also have a high number of homeless people living here. And we also host the world, we're the beach. So, you know, pre-COVID numbers, um, you know, we think that there could be anywhere like 10 million people visiting here annually. So how do we really, how do we get the city to work with us to provide public health and safety to every single person here in Venice? And this is something that we are committed to working with everyone on. We wanna get your feedback. We want to get your opinion. 
And that's why we have created uh, a, a public safety at venicenc.org email address. We want to hear from you. Uh, send us your public health and safety concerns. If we cannot address those tonight and this evening, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to do that you know, at a later meeting. And if you have a topic that you wanna talk about and you believe that it's crucial towards you know, Venice public health and safety, we'll work with you to make sure this happens. And we're really committed. You know, we, we wanna talk to people from different sides. We may not have the same approach, but I believe that everyone here really wants the same end goal. And that's just, you know, to provide for everyone and just make sure that we're all safe and healthy. So with that, I'm now going to turn it over uh, to my new committee members. I believe that I've picked, you know, some really, uh, some critical thinkers, uh, some great minds, people who are gonna do a lot of work and make sure that, you know, we are really giving you the best info that we can. And so from here, I'm gonna turn it over. I'd like everyone to, you know, basically introduce themselves, maybe say what part of Venice they live in. And if you have an announcement, feel free to. And by the way, I live in uh, North Venice Beach and I've been here for permanently for six years now. So with that, I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, John. Why don't you start off for us? And let's see, we're gonna oh, unmute uh, you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, John Beginski. I've been in uh, Venice about 30 years now. Um, living all over the place, on the beach, inland, uh, and, and generally it's just a place I love. And, I, and this is what I wanna give back a little bit and participate, because I know that this is a, a critical issue in the last handful of years that just seems to be getting worse and worse. So I, I really wanna participate in trying to make it a safer, nicer place for more people. Um. Uh, who's next? Do we have um, Helen? I believe you're up next. Sure. Yeah. Hi, my name's Helen Fallon. I've lived in Venice for over 45 years, and I've certainly seen a lot of changes in Venice, but what I've seen in the last couple of years is really disturbing, and I don't think it's the community that many of us moved to, and I'd like to see that changed. I believe we can have a, we should have a safe community where families can be safe and feel comfortable raising their children, just as I did in this community. Thank you. Alan, you're up next. Hi, I'm Alan Parsons. I've lived in Santa, I lived in Santa Monica from, from about 2012, but worked in Venice um, and then bought a home in Venice in 2016. And uh, just in, even in, since 2016, I've seen uh, kind of a, a decline in the quality of life in Venice and an increase in the crime um, in Venice. I live in Windward Circle. Um, so one of the things I'm interested in is, is kind of making data driven decisions. Um, and, and that's kind of what I do for a living. So I'm happy to use that skill set uh, here after work in the community to help improve Venice. And then I think we skipped Eva. Eva, do you want to go and introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Eva Green, and I've lived in the Silver Triangle for about 20 years now, and I have actually 22 years, and I saw it when it was start, first starting to change, you know, being more gentrified, and now I'm seeing a, a real rapid decline, and I'm really sad about it because uh, Venice really hosts the world, and I think we have a responsibility uh, not just to the people that lived here, but to all of Los Angeles, because this is their recreational park. And uh, we can't let the whole city and county down. Uh, we have to provide for them as the Coastal Commission says. Uh, so we have a special responsibility as being an area that is coastal like Venice is. Thank you. My name is Mark Ryavec. I've been in Venice uh, at this location near the Windward Traffic Circle for 31 years. Um, I believe this committee is long overdue. Um, we're at the midst of a perfect storm, both with COVID um, and with an intersecting dramatic increase in the homeless population, just as the city is unfortunately um, making what I consider very misguided cuts in the LAPD. And I'm looking forward to us having discussions about how we best handle 
all those three phenomenons that are so impacting our community right now. Okay, and then, um, you know, Ira, um, could you try to make sure that Alan Parsons and Eva Green are co-hosts? Oh yeah, I was just gonna ask you, Eva I made, because I remembered that. Uh, yeah, I'll do Alan. And okay. Eva might want to uh, connect her audio, oh, excuse me, her, her video. <laughs> every every meeting, she's, she, she said her camera's broken, so every meeting, we have the same conversation. Okay. We'll send her a webcam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll raise her salary. <laughs> Double it, actually. And so now we're going to go on to, um, you know, the public comment section. So, you know, as the chair, uh, I've set the public comment 30 seconds for non-agendized items. They must be related to public health and safety and this committee. And so we're gonna do a total of 10 minutes. Um, I have, we are trying to do something. Uh, let's see if we can make this happen. Um, I am, let's see, how am I gonna do this? We just did the Zoom training. I'm trying to share my, I'm, we're trying to give you something better than a, um, you know, an iPhone. Uh, so let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. Now, um, Soledad, there are four. Oh, wow. That's great. All right. We're trying to get really yeah. you know, fancy here. <laughs> uh, you had four hands raised. So it's up to you if you want to um, close public comment with those four people or how you want to handle it. I mean, now there are six. At some point, you can close it or just let it keep going, but whatever. But. Let's go ahead and close it. I see the last person. Is, uh, now there's eight. Okay. I, think, I see the last person is Shante Hardesty. So that'll be the last person to speak. And well, okay. James Ramirez has joined. So we'll, we'll cut it off at James Ramirez. Okay. And it's five. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Too late. All right. Let's, let's try this uh, this fancy clock. So Alan, hey. do you have first? Let's see. I think it's, it's Joey Buckets. And I think the process is that we, we allow to talk, right, Ira? Yeah, you process. have to unmute them. You, you have to unmute them and then mute them again. And then lower hand. Yeah, well, the hands go down after they talk usually. All right, so first one's gonna be Joey's Buckets. Go ahead. Uh, when you're ready, uh, say your name and I'll start your clock. Hey there, um, it sounds like you really don't wanna hear public comment if you're limiting it this way. I just wanted to note that um, it's funny that you think homeless people aren't permanent residents of Venice and the way you separated that, um, it really tells me what you think of them. Second, you're talking about homeless people, there's not a single homeless services provider or homeless person on this panel. Um, third, you didn't mention at all the amount of illegal evictions skyrocketing in this neighborhood. You know white collar crime like wage theft is 90% of all crimes committed, or do you not care about that? Thank you very much. Uh, who do we have next, Ellen? Next is Damon T. All right, sir, say your name and we'll start your clock. Yeah, this is Damon. I just wanted to note that Soledad said this was a diverse panel. It seems to me it's just the biggest unhoused haters in all of Venice. You have Eva Braun Green, who's the uh, chief propagandist for the Venice Neighborhood Council. You have Alan Parsons, who on Twitter refers to unhoused advocates as terrorists. You have Helen, who just outright hates home, homeless people. And you have Mark Ryavik, the biggest dead-eyed Nazi Three seconds, the entire sir. neighborhood council system. Uh, Alan, who's next? Hold on. Uh, Sean O'Brien. OK, Sean, state your name, and I'll start your clock. Yeah, hi, uh, Soledad. This is Sean. Uh, hey, I'm so happy uh, you guys put this fantastic rock star panel together. So happy to be able to work with you, help make ch changes better for the future. Uh, so willing to and happy to work with the police. Glad that they're here today. Uh, they need our support as well. Thank you, guys. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so we will stop it there. Um, all right. Uh, Alan, who's next? Next is Stacy Dawson Stearns. Okay, Stacy, go ahead, state your name, and when you're ready, we'll start your clock. Uh, hi, can you hear me? This is Stacy Dawson Stearns. 
Okay, um, I just want to just interject, y'all. Mark said something wrong. Um, there has not been a cut to the police budget. The $150 million cut that Garcetti said he was doing was a cut to a proposed increase, and that did not happen. In fact, the budget has not been cut, and next year's budget is even bigger. So please stop repeating Michael Moore's lies, and you can have his officers comment on that when it's their turn to present. But get your facts right. Thank you. Okay, who do we have next? Hold on here. I hope you guys are liking this clock. You know, this took us a lot of training. Uh, Christine, I want to get that for our meetings. Facts. All right, uh, go ahead, state your name, and we'll start your clock for your speaking. Christine, go ahead. Hi, sorry about that. I've been a resident for um, about four years, and um, this committee is so great and so necessary. I just want to stress that it is important for diversity to include people of different economic backgrounds, um, races on this call. We have a bunch of white people, it looks like it, gentrifiers, and the cops who are proudly standing in front of a flag that is a Nazi flag, un-American and treasonous. Fuck the police. Good night. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. Ellen, uh, who's up next? Uh, Steve is up next. All right, Steve, go ahead, uh, state your name, and we'll start the clock for you to speak. Okay, uh, this is Steve Iron Louis. I've lived in Venice for 15 years. Um, and, you know, our, our street here on, on Navy Street is just beset with crime, but it's just getting worse and worse. Uh, we have, you know, we've had five fires in our alley. We have homeless people or people jumping our fences, invading our property. I mean, it's just out of control. We had a, a drug van set up last night and was dealing all night on camera. I mean, we're really being kind of invaded here by a criminal element. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ellen, who's next? Hold on here. Next is, and I'm gonna butcher this, Shante Hardesty. Okay, uh, go ahead, state your name and we'll start the clock for your public comment. Can you hear me? Okay, hi, my name is Shantae Hardesty. That was correct, thank you. I'm so grateful for this panel. I live on Navy Street with Steve. We've been bombarded with homeless uh, people robbing us, setting fires. The crime is out of control. I've lived here all my life, but I've never seen it this bad. Thank you, Jack, Alan, Eva, Mark, all the people on this panel. I agree with everything you say. We need to move the homeless out of here, please, as soon as possible. Sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. Time's up. Um, all right. Who do we have next, Ellen? Uh, next is Jim Urez. Okay. And is he our last person for He's our last the non agenda public comment? Okay. Jim, go ahead. Uh, state your name. We'll start the clock for you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. James Murez, I'll lower my hand too. Um, I want to thank you for, for creating this committee. Um, I want to ask the police officers if there's anything they can do for the campers that pull multiple uh, citations because it's cheaper to pay a $60 bill um, for, for no street sweeping than it is to move their vehicle. Is there anything that can be done to escalate those fees? Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, guys, we did it. Uh, so let's see what is up next. Uh, let me share my agenda. Or actually, uh, now we are going on to, uh, it's our government reports. And so today I'm really excited. We're going to have a COVID-19 update and we have new partners with us from LA County Department of Public Health. Uh, we're very excited to be working with them and they're going to give us a COVID-19 update that is specific to us. So let's see, so let's unmute our host. Uh, let's unmute Nancy. Okay. There we go. Hi, um, hi everyone. Good night, good evening. Um, we're all very happy to be here. As you heard, there's our, there are several uh, Department of Public Health representatives um, in this meeting today. So we are excited um, to provide this update. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, and I do want to share that we do have uh, Dr. Silvia Prieto, who's the Regional Health Officer for the South Bay and East Regions. 
uh, who will be available to answer questions um, at the end of this really quick presentation that I'll provide you all. Um, so again, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Nancy Rodriguez. I'm a health program analyst with the South Bay Regional Health Office. Um, and I'm really happy to be here to provide you all a quick overview of COVID um, and then to answer your questions at the end of this uh, presentation. So, um, you know, some of these, um, some of these, um, I don't know if you can see my screen. I just wanna make sure you can see my screen. I can see your screen. Yes, yep. perfect. Um, so some of this will be repetitive, but we just think it's really important, um, you know, in order to protect ourselves and reduce the transmission of COVID-19, I think we all um, need to understand what it is and how it spreads. Um, so it's important um, that we review this information. So the virus is named for the spikes on the cell membranes, uh, which resemble uh, a crown or the sun's corona. Um, Coronaviruses can cause different diseases, everything from the common cold uh, to some more serious respiratory diseases, including SARS and MERS. Um, coronaviruses are not new. However, this new strain hasn't been seen in humans before. Um, and illness from this virus can range from um, mild, uh, some people get no symptoms at all, to severe, which is why it's even more important that we take the proper precautions um, to stop the spread. So how do coronaviruses Spread. Um, like other respiratory illnesses, um, the coronavirus uh, most commonly spreads to others from an infected person through droplets produced through coughing, sneezing, and talking, uh, as well as post close personal contact, such as caring for an infected person. Um, COVID-19 may also spread by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it and then touching uh, your mouth, nose, or eyes but this is not thought to be the main way that the virus spreads. Um, some people um, do get COVID-19 without showing any symptoms at all, but that does not mean that they cannot spread the infection to others. Um, so what you'll see on the screen um, is a list of symptoms of COVID-19. This is not an all-inclusive list, um, but some commonly seen symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, or trouble breathing. Um, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, um, sore throat, and the list goes on. Again, illness can vary from mild to severe. Some people show no symptoms at all. Um, and signs of illness can begin anywhere from two to 14 days from infection. So when should you seek medical care? Most importantly, stay home if you're sick. Um, most people with respiratory infections like the flu or COVID-19 will have mild illness and get better without needing to see a doctor. Um, however, if you are 65 years or older or have a weak immune system or any other medical conditions such as heart, lung, or kidney, kidney disease, um, or diabetes, any condition that can lead to a weakened immune system, we do encourage um, you to call your doctor early on as these conditions can present a greater risk for developing serious complications. Um, we do encourage you to call your doctor before visiting the doctor. There are um, protocols in place for in-person visits. Um, and of course, seek medical care immediately if your symptoms do get worse, um, such as having difficulty breathing, pressure, um, or pain in your chest, bluish lips, um, and some additional symptoms that you can see in the slide. So should you get tested? Test, um, sorry, tested is available um, throughout the county. Um, if you have symptoms or were exposed to someone who has COVID-19, we do recommend that you get tested. Um, call your doctor or visit covid19.lacounty.gov slash testing to schedule an appointment. Um, and of course, if you are very sick, we encourage you to seek medical attention. Um, so we know certain populations can be more vulnerable to serious illness um, from COVID-19. Uh, people experiencing homelessness are um, one of these populations. Um, because people experiencing homelessness are often older adults or have underlying medical conditions, um, they can be at greater risk. Um, many of the recommendations that we make to prevent COVID-19 may be difficult for a person experiencing homelessness to adhere to, um, but DPH is working with um, service providers across the county to ensure that uh, these populations are protected from COVID-19. Um, we're providing masks and hand sanitizers um, as part of regular outreach, um, we are working with shelters and outreach teams to ensure that individuals that are identified as positive do have a safe place to isolate and quarantine through medical sheltering sites. Um, and we also have Project Room Key, which has provided a network where people experiencing homelessness who are asymptomatic and highly vulnerable can safely isolate and prevent um, exposure from COVID-19. 
Um, we also know that individuals with um, some chronic conditions uh, ha also have an increased risk for severe illness. Um, and we do know that risk for severe illness with COVID-19 increases with age, with older adults um, being at the highest risk. Um, so it is important that people that are at increased risk and those who live with them um, or visit them do take additional precautions to protect them. So with that um, in mind, uh, we'll take a look at our case numbers as they stand in LA County as of today. Um, unfortunately, we did report um, our highest daily number of new cases and people hospitalized with COVID-19 today. Um, once again, with a total of um, 7,854 new cases, um, which brings our total case count to 421,881. Um, we did report an additional 44 deaths. Um, which brings our, uh, our total deaths to um, 7,782. Um, and again, our current, uh, our current hospitalization rate is the highest we've seen it at um, over 2,500. And 23% of these are um, cases that are in the ICU. Um, and of course, we've seen our positivity rate um, escalate very quickly over the last month. Um, we were at 3.9% on November 1st, and we're now at 13.0%. So what, um, what is the department um, doing? We are facing one of the most dangerous moments in the pandemic um, currently, and really the only effective path forward uh, requires us to take immediate action. And unfortunately that means additional sacrifice. Um, when the rate of increase is as high as it is right now, uh, it can be harder to slow the spread and heading into colder months and flu season uh, compounds that sense of urgency. Uh, as new COVID-19 cases remain at these alarmingly high levels, um, the number of people hospitalized continues to increase. A temporary health officer order has been issued requiring additional safety measures across sectors. Um, you may have heard of this order. Um, it did go into effect this past Monday, November 30th, um, and it aims to reduce transmission by asking individuals to remain in their homes and with their immediate household as much as possible, reduce mingling with others that are not in your household, um, requiring everyone to wear a face covering whenever they engage in activities outside of their home and are or can be in contact with others that are not part of their household, um, and reducing capacity at sites, at sites where non-household members mingle uh, to avoid crowding. We know that all public and private gatherings and events with individuals not from your household are prohibited at this time, except uh, face-to-face services and protests as they are constitutionally protected rights. Um, and residents are still permitted to travel to and from essential businesses to work or to provide services to a healthcare operation or essential business. Um, we do know that restaurants, bars and breweries and wineries remain closed for in-person dining and drinking at this time, um, but they are permitted to remain open for pickup, delivery and takeout. And breweries and wineries can remain open for retail sales at 20% occupancy. Uh, and of course, personal care establishments can only provide services um, with an appointment and only those services that do not require the removal of a face covering. Uh, and they cannot serve food or drinks to customers at this time. Uh, the department is also ensuring that we stay focused on facts. We want to ensure that we avoid blaming anyone or assuming someone has the disease because of the way they look or their origin. Um, I think we need to understand infectious diseases are not connected to any specific racial, ethnic group or other population. Um, the county is committed to assuring that all residents affected by COVID-19 are treated with respect and compassion and that we all separate facts from fear and guard against stigma. Um, we're all responsible for taking individual actions to control the surge that we're currently seeing, and we're asking that community members please do their part and help us by adhering uh, to the current guidance that's in place. So how do we do this? Some ways that you can protect yourself um, and others um, from getting COVID-19. Most importantly right now, again, just I want to emphasize that we all need to stay home as much as possible. Even if you don't feel sick, uh, the simple act of being around people outside of your household is extremely risky right now. Um, so avoid doing any activities that are not essential. Um, if you do have to leave home, please wear a soft face covering securely over your nose and mouth and uh, practice physical distancing. If you live with people who are older or have an underlying health condition, um, wear a face covering even inside your house. 
um, cloth face coverings do provide an extra layer uh, to help prevent respiratory droplets from traveling in the air and onto other people. And anytime a person removes their mask and interacts in close distance with others that are not in their household, even if it's outdoors, uh, risk either infecting the other person or becoming infected themselves. The longer the interaction, the higher uh, the risk of COVID-19 spread. So we've taken action in the past. Um, these, we've proven that these actions have worked um, to prevent transmission in our community. We just have to make sure that we continue to do this to sl slow the current surge. Um, additional you know, healthy habits, I'm sure you've all heard these. Uh, wash your hands well and often for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Uh, practice physical distancing and avoid co close contact, like kissing, sharing cups, or utensils with uh, people that are outside of your household and may be sick. Um, I would also urge the Venice community members to visit our website for the most up-to-date information. We post official updates, including information about new cases and possible public exposures through our press releases, social media accounts, and our website. Uh, we do have regular telebriefings for specific sectors, such as for elected officials, early care and education settings and retail, among others. If you are interested, uh, please email the email address that is on the slide, liaisoncovid19 at ph.lecounty.gov and indicate what sector you are part of um, and they will send you information about the telebriefing. Uh, our county website also um, has some additional resources um, about paid sick leave, disability um, and unemployment assistance as well as testing information um, and some additional resources um, that may be helpful to community members. And all this can be found um, on covid19.lacounty.gov. And lastly, um, we know that it's just as important to take care of your emotional health as it is to take care of your physical health. Uh, this is a worrying and stressful time for all of us. Uh, we encourage everyone to stay informed from credible sources, um, to stay connected virtually with your community, your family and your friends, uh, and just remember that we're all in this together. We're all going through this together. Um, and we, um, you know, we're here for you. And we do have additional resources um, through the LA County Department of Mental Health. Um, so uh, their website um, is bmh.lacounty.gov. Um, we also have this uh, phone number that is uh, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, that is on the screen if you need additional uh, local resources to address mental health. And with that, we will transition to um, questions. So we'll take questions and um, I'll invite Dr. Prieto to um, unmute herself. And Soledad, I don't know if you want to um, facilitate the questions. Um. Yeah. And so uh, so what we'll do is we'll, we kind of set a, a designated order, uh, just how we're going to ask questions among our committee. We've also received some, uh, you know, just via email and, you know, to everybody, you know, send us emails, public safety at venicenc.org. Um, so, you know, send us these emails. And with that, I'm going to first open it up to uh, John from our committee to sort of lead the way with some questions. So go ahead, John. Do you want us to go in alph alphabetic order, order Soledad? Yeah, I think we just stick to that the whole time just to be, you know, fair and equal with all of our questions. So John would be first. Maybe other questions. I'm really curious. It looks like we're right around the corner from getting some vac some vaccines. We know the homeless are a very vulnerable population, and we also know there's a lot of issues uh, moving homeless populations once they get settled um, because of the CDC stay in place policy. So I'm really curious how fast and what is your strategy to get the homeless um, in Venice uh, vaccinated as quickly as possible so we can get them moved to to safer places, better locations. Good evening, this is Dr. Prieto. So um, for those of you that have been following the um, ever-changing world of the vaccine, just this week, um, the government um, did lay out who is their uh, first, uh, what they're calling 1A priority. And that is um, members um, in skilled nursing um, homes, as well as healthcare workers. And I think the reason that they chose um, those in skilled nursing homes is that unfortunately those have been um, the people who have been most effective in terms of deaths. If you look at the number of deaths, especially um, early on in the um, pandemic, you could see that they were the most vulnerable. 
And so it makes sense um, to um, prioritize them as a group. And then healthcare workers, because obviously we need healthcare workers to be healthy and available uh, to care for everybody um, who um, unfortunately gets ill from the pandemic or just from heart attacks or whatever else that um, they need medical services. So in terms of the homeless um, receiving the vaccine, um, they will probably um, not be eligible until um, about the time when the general public is, um, and that'll be sometime in the springtime. Uh, then to answer your question in terms of um, the housing situation and moving um, anybody who has um, COVID and is homeless, is that correct? Was that the second part of your question? Uh, no, that really wasn't the second part. The second part, oh, sorry. The, 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 there's a lot of rules in place. The CDC has a safer in place sort of recommendations that once uh, homeless are sort of located in a particular place due to the COVID um, environment we're, we're all living in now that, that you have to be careful moving people around. And as soon as you can get the vaccine, you can start moving from an emergency sort of crisis management situation to sort of more uh, typical policy. And I'm curious how fast we can get the homeless population vaccinated, one for their health, and so we can then maybe move them to better locations, safer locations. So again, I, I think it's gonna be around springtime. Okay. Uh, I keep getting the next person up. Yeah. Um, my question is related to also the homeless issue. Um, we have bridged housing here and we've been told, uh, stakeholder contacted our committee and, said, and advised us that there were people in the bridge housing, both the staff and the people living there who weren't masking you know, socially distancing, et cetera. So what are the rules for bridge housing? What is public health expecting those service providers to require of the people living in bridge housing and also the staff working there? So our rules are basically the same um, for anybody. Whenever they're in contact with anybody who is not a member of their household, they should be using a mask if they're within uh, six feet. So. Um, the workers and the clients should be masking at all times, again, unless they're in their room um, or, uh, you know, going to sleep um, or eating. I mean, there's obviously a few exceptions. Um, so that's why we um, encourage them to um, set up different um, uh, ways to protect the homeless and the staff. So for instance, um, they eat at, uh, we try to get them to eat at different times if they can't socially distance everybody. So rather than having one meal time, maybe having two or three use um, where they, what's called contactless um, giving of meals where they just give the meal and the person takes it in a bag or a box and then goes uh, to their room to eat it or to their table. So there's various things that um, need to be done. But the basic, um, premise is that the rules are the same at the shelter um, as it is in other locations. Um, are there people who do not follow the rules? I'm sure there are both at the shelters and unshelters. When we walk uh, anywhere, you, you frequently see people not only uh, potentially not wearing the mask, sometimes they're wearing it, but really they're wearing it incorrectly and that's not doing anybody any good. So it's really important that people um, try to wear the mask correctly, meaning that it has to cover both your nose and your mouth and that you try not to touch your um, eyes um, because again, you can uh, introduce the virus that way. Are you, are you doing inspections at the various bridge housings to see that oh, there's yes. compliance? We okay. regularly do um, inspections. We, our environmental health division does inspections. In fact, they're the ones who um, will license um, the homes so that they can operate. If there is an outbreak, our team goes out and physically goes to the location, makes suggestions about uh, what can be done to improve um, the hygiene there, you know, the frequently touched surfaces to make sure that they're being cleaned often, uh, those kind of things. Um, we are, um, anytime there's an outbreak, we go out and we do that. And we send out a nurse, uh, sometimes a nurse and a physician, as well as some other support staff. Thank you. Uh, Mark, your turn. 
I sure think it's Eva that's next. Oh, Eva? Yeah. Um, I have a question only because I've had several people in my neighborhood ask me this and talk about it. And I'd like to maybe get a straight answer. And if it can't be announced or told tonight, then maybe at the next meeting, if somebody could come out or email us. But a lot of people are getting a little tired of wearing the masks and, and they're cumbersome, but you know, I know why we do it. But uh, is there a way to show the difference in numbers between the regular uh, flu influenza versus this? Because I'd like to settle that once and for all with the skeptics. Uh, so if you guys have any numbers that you could share with us, uh, you know, from last year when it was influenza and this year when it's COVID. Uh, that's, that's my question, thank you. So I'm not sure if this is a question of how um, easily transmissible it is or is this about the death? Yeah, and, it's about um, the death, it's about the deaths, transmission and hospitalizations basically. Yeah, so- And if so, it also would affect the, the elderly in the same way in same percentages. So there's uh, several reasons why this is worse is that um, because none of us have experienced this, that's why it's called a novel virus, meaning it's new. Uh, we don't have any uh, natural defenses against it. Oh. So um, that's why we're all at risk. And also there is no vaccine. So if you think about normally the reason why we don't see as much deaths from uh, the regular flu is several reasons. One, it's not what's called as virulent. That means it's not as deadly. The second thing is that we, we have a vaccine. And thirdly, we, it's been, people have been exposed to it. So even though it's not the exact same strain, sometimes it gives them partial immunity so they don't get as sick. And possibly um, this is a more um, easily transmissible um, because there's so many people that are asymptomatic. And so you don't know that you have it and you're passing it on. Whereas with the regular flu, we don't think it's as common for people to be asymptomatic, especially adults. In children, it tends to be a little bit more common for them to be um, asymptomatic with the flu. Um, but certainly adults, that's less common. So uh, it's because of all of those factors that it is very, um, it's much more likely to result in hospitalization as well as deaths. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. It was very clear. Um, that way I can share this with others. Thank you. Great, thank you. Alan's next. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to yield whatever questions I have. Um, I, well, I, actually I'll, I'll hang tight. Um, so with the Newsom and, and uh, uh, Garcetti announcements that came both yesterday and today, uh, they seem to contradict a lot of the recommendations that you made on your slideshow today. Um, for instance, like beer and wine sales, um, TBD if they are necessarily essential, um, but traveling to and from is banned. So I was wondering if you could clarify, like the, I wonder if you could clarify those points because the recommendations that Newsom and Garcetti have made contradict the points that were made in your presentation a couple minutes ago. So I think you're, you're referring to Dr. Ferrer's um, presentation. Um, and I don't know the exact nature of what the difference is. So um, I don't know if anybody on the team can address that, I apologize. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll speak to that. This this actually, I mean, you know, I think New Governor Newsom made his announcements maybe like an hour before um, before we gave this presentation. So um, I did that's see fair. his announcements. It just there just wasn't enough time to update this. Um, additionally, this is the latest that the LA County uh, Department of Public Health has released. So until we get official word that our guidance is going to be aligned with the state, then you know this, th that's the reason that the presentation stayed the way that it is. Um, that's not to say that tomorrow there might not be a press release by DPH saying that the guidance will be aligned with Governor Newsom. Um, so it really it was just a matter of, of, of timing. But I did see Governor Newsom's update um, just before this meeting. Got it. No, yeah. And, and for clarity, that was, question was directed towards you, Nancy. So apologies, Dr. Pierre. Pietro. So thanks. 
Um, I have a question about dense environments outside. Um, I know that the, the, the state and the county, or at least the county believes that um, people being together in outside dining uh, needs to stop for at least three weeks. I'm curious about dense environments, particularly around very popular shopping districts like Abbott Kinney in Venice um, and weekends with many people sort of still coming to the boardwalk. Um, if the county has given any thought to um, mandating in those kind of dense environments that people have to have masks and actually putting some LAPD officers out there to remind them that they need to wear masks because um, you walk along a long stretch of um, Abakini or a long stretch of the boardwalk, you can get that 10 to 15 minutes exposure to other people. And I'm just asking if we're closing down outdoor dining, then why aren't we being a bit stricter in these other dense outside environments? So the rules are still the same that if you're outdoors and you're going to be interacting with others that you should be wearing a mask. So that is our current, um, but in fact, now we're just going to probably uh, stay at home. So you actually shouldn't be even outdoors unless it's for um, that you're going to or from an essential service. Um, but be that as it may, you're outside um, for whatever reason, you, you should be wearing a mask. And is there any enforcement? Um, Other than Santa Monica, maybe. I don't believe that uh, there, um, there currently is for um, anything outdoors. And one that would probably depend on the local law enforcement. Um, you know, LA County is covered by so many different uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, so, so it's up to, local, have to local be a, option. A local. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, you, thank you so much for that. I, I think I have more of a rhetorical question. Uh, you know, I love this presentation. How do we get our elected officials to, you know, follow these rules and practice what they preach? Uh, you know, unfortunately, recently we saw our supervisor, Sheila Kuehl and Governor Newsom not really following some of the orders that they preach. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd love to have you guys, you know, this isn't really a question, but you know, thank you so much for you know coming on and really expressing to us the safety concerns that we face. And you know, we hope that you can share this with everyone. And so, you know, so thank you. This is the first time I've worked with you. We're really excited to have you guys here and we hope to work with you in the future. And from here, we are now, let me share my screen. Um, we are now going to move on to uh, item seven, it's our public safety LAPD report. Um, and from here, we're gonna let Mark Ryavac take over. He's gonna be our moderator for this session. So Mark, I now defer to you and thank you to our our LA County health reps. Uh, this was so informative. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah thank I'd you. like to thank yeah. the, the county public health representatives also for taking time out of your evening to, to join us. Um, I'd like to switch to um, LAPD Pacific Division and um, invite uh, whichever one of the officers there. I, I vaguely remember that Captain Ambridge indicated he might not be able to make it quite on time. Or are you there, mm -hmm. Captain? Well, then I'll turn it over to you, Captain. Um, we would like to be um, the setting in which once a month we get a crime statistic report and we get um, a, a report on certain public safety issues that are developing in the community and that we need to broadcast to, um, to the residents. And, uh, and then we'll provide, a, looking forward to providing a report directly to Venice Neighborhood Council. So I'll turn it over to you, Captain. Sure. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. First and foremost, I want to thank the uh, VNC for creating this subcommittee because I know it becomes a distraction somewhat at the regular VNC meeting. And I do certainly appreciate that you guys take your public safety so seriously. Uh, first point of uh, first point that I did want to make was I know a lot of people were concerned about the arrest of Dylan Brumley. If uh, people do not re remember it, um, October 28th, uh, 
he was a person who was involved in a robbery with Mr. Jesus Valdiva. And as a result of that robbery, Mr. Jesus Valdiva, who was riding his bicycle, fell, hit his head, suffered a heart attack and passed. Uh, Dylan Brumley was arrested by Pacific officers on that day. He was later coronavirus released. The coroner's office conducted an investigation and as a result of their autopsy, they determined that Mr. Valdiva died as a result of a homicide. Uh, Jamie Page did a very interesting article following up on this homicide that occurred in Pacific area. And uh, our officers were out there today, located Mr. Bromley and took him into custody without incident. So he is back in custody and will be charged with robbery and homicide. Okay, uh, so the other thing that we did want to talk about was, uh, did you guys have any questions for us that you wanted to get into? Otherwise, I could talk about other crime issues within Pacific area. I have one broad issue that was, uh, we have several questions that have been sent in, Captain. And one of them is a, a very broad question. Um, it comes from Jamie Page, one of our VNC uh, board members. And it's basically, um, We've been told that certain units, um, sexual assault unit, um, <coughs> cruelty, um, and I guess, and I think also the um, homeless outreach are all being disbanded. And the question um, becomes, where are, where's the LAPD in the process of disbanding and who then picks up those tasks and who do residents call, reach out to um, in those areas or any other areas that are being um, cut uh, due to the, the funding cuts of the LAPD. Yeah, so as a result of the funding cuts, uh, we're looking at a realistic, a real number of a reduction in force, about 7% of the LAPD. So that's 500 officers off the books that we are not going to replace. So, I mean, I don't want to get into argument of whether it's a budget cut or not, but the bottom line is we've got $150 million less to pay personnel with, so we've got 500 less officers. So one thing that we are appreciative at our level, at the area level operations like Pacific Area and the other 20 commands within the city, is that Chief Moore is uh, focusing on our essential functions, and that is responding to calls for service, providing, uh, providing the ability to respond to your neighborhoods. So the cost we are paying because we are 500 officers short of where we started the year <clears throat> is uh, the department has made the decision to disband some of these specialized units like Mark talked about. So one, one of the casualties of that, uh, of that reorganization is going to be the special assault section from robbery homicide division. They typically handle uh, high profile sex cases such as uh, the Ron Jeremy case is going on right now. They assisted us with that. Uh, rape that occurred on, um, on Venice Beach in which the 29-year-old PhD student was, was raped and uh, they, they solved it. They, they arrested the man. He is, going, he is facing a, a life term in sentence. So that's going to be a big loss for the department because it's a lot of specialization. We're also losing our Bureau of Hope units, which engage with, our, with the, the hope, uh, homeless outreach uh, proactive engagement officers. Uh, we're going to lose them. Uh, our own Venice Beach detail Somewhat took a cut. We, we typically have 42 officers assigned to the beach. That number has been reduced to 26. So across the city, we have specialized divisions, but the point of it being <clears throat> is that officers are being transitioned out of those specialized assignments back into operations. So if you look at some of those specialized detectives that have a lot of experience, and we'll just take the special assault section uh, as an example, those, those detectives are not leaving the department but that expertise is being pushed out to the areas. So whatever bureau they get sent out to, for example, in our area, West Bureau has our own sexual assault unit. We will probably absorb those detectives coming from downtown into West Bureau. So that expertise will not be lost. It just won't be centralized like it was in the past. Uh, what we are looking at is if we do not receive the $100 million budget increase that we're looking for next year because a lot of that is to pay to maintain the force at its current structure because you know a lot of labor issues where we, we have built-in cost of living allowance increases we don't get those hundred million dollars and we're probably looking at a further reduction in force a further reduction capability 
So the numbers that we're looking at right now, 95, about 9,500, 9,600 officers, take us back to force structure we haven't seen since about 2007. And the difference is that our call load has increased by about 63%, significant amount of calls. So we're not going to be, uh, with, with a smaller force, we are not going to be able to handle all of the same responsibilities we have been handling. And we're looking for alternative service providers that can share that uh, response with us. Before we move on to the other questions, uh, Captain, are, are there any particular developments in the statistics for the last month that you would like to pass on? A particular area of crime that um, is peaking that we need to be particularly aware of? Uh, sure. Aggravated assaults since, uh, since summer have, have been troubling, however that slowed. My biggest concern right now within the last month is perhaps uh, residential burglaries. Over the last four weeks, compared to the prior four weeks, we're up about 24%. And for the entire year, we've been up down about 5%. We're down about 100 burglaries from where we typically are at this point in this year. But uh, recently, we have seen an increase in burglaries. And about one-fourth of those over the last two weeks have been people leaving their residences unlocked. I, I, I know it's kind of unusual that you feel like anytime you're, even if you're at home, you need to lock all your doors and your windows. But we have people, mostly unhoused persons, who are going around and checking for open doors or entering open windows. And I think it's kind of increased because the temperature has, has cooled down a little bit and they're looking for more opportunities to go in and uh, shelter. That certainly makes sense. Um, let, let me move on to uh, some of the other questions that um, have come in um, from residents. Uh, Travis Binnan asked, uh, major U.S. cities who previously released uh, county in in inmates due to COVID are now facing problems with repeat offenders. In Detroit, one of the convicted sex offenders is back in jail after prosecutors say he got out and raped three women at knife point. How many people has L.A. County early released, and are we facing uh, similar uh, repeats, uh, criminal repetition from this same audience. All right, Travis, thanks for that question, because that's one thing that's been troubling us since the start of this coronavirus. So typically the, uh, LA, the LA County houses about an inmate population, about 17,000. Early on into the crisis, they, they drastically reduced the amount of persons uh, held in custody. And I think it was around March or April where they reduced it by about 5,000. 5,000 people. So a third, so, about a third of the population. About a third of the population. And as a result of that, we moved to a revised zero bail schedule, which has been very troubling for us. We're on our third uh, zero bail schedule right now. So uh, unless you commit a violent felony or you're a recidivist where you get some type of uh, bail enhancement, you are probably going to be arrested, receive a zero bail, and walk out the front door. Uh, just anecdotally tell you, uh, um, tell you about one of our car thefts because car theft is one of the biggest issues in our region right now. One of our car theft suspects, we arrested five times. I don't know if you guys remember seeing the pursuit on TV in which the suspect crashed and as a result of that crash, lost one of his arms. That was his third uh, stolen car. He went on to steal several more cars before we could actually finally get the court to keep him in custody. So recidivism is certainly an issue that's a, that's a problem with us. We have uh, drug dealers who we've arrested three times before they would be held in custody. And we're trying every, we have, we've directed our personnel to do everything they can to try to keep somebody in custody and achieve some type of bail enhancement. So zero bail is one issue. Another issue, it doesn't mean that people who even don't qualify for zero bail does not mean that they can't bail out. So we have aggravated assault suspects, people who you know, hit somebody with a hammer or whatever, they're still eligible for bail and they just need to come up with 10% of that bail schedule amount. Is there any movement afoot to, to change that zero bail situation in these um, situations where there are re repeat crimes? Yeah, the, the, department's, the department's aggressively seeking uh, uh, longer terms, especially of recidivists, but it's not up to us. It's up to the courts, and that's, it's up to L.A. County. You mean the DA's office? Well, Los, An Los Angeles County, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Lofredo Morales asks, I am very concerned about the sudden increase of homeless on homeless crimes. 
The number of stabbings and tent burnings due to what seem like turf wars are way out of control. Does the LAPD have the responsibility to equally protect the housed and the unhoused from crime? And if so, do you know if the, uh, our council member has told the LAPD to make this a priority? Well, uh, the way we see it, we have a responsibility to, uh, to protect everyone. And that's one of the reasons why we pay attention to, to this population, because when I look at my aggravated assaults across the uh, Pacific area, namely Venice Beach, about 56% of our aggravated assaults, and those are serious assaults in which somebody uses a weapon or hits somebody or, or with potential of causing serious bodily injury, 56% of those involve a person experiencing homelessness, whether they're suspects, victims, or both in the case both suspects and victims so we try to pay attention to that population uh we have a somewhat limited ability to uh, engage with them for example at venice beach we enforce 6344 but what does that really mean we write them a ticket and uh, seek voluntary compliance thank you um laura valdivia asked during the recent public safety town hall for all of CD11, Michael Moore suggested we activate <coughs> our ring and other CCTV type video captures so we can identify those offenders that are preying upon our neighborhoods. Um, Ms. Val Valdivia asked, can personal security camera footage be used to help the LAPD hold people accountable for crimes committed in public spaces that are captured on these cameras? Uh, that's a good point. So over the last several years, uh, video footage or the cost of, uh, of cameras has great, greatly been reduced. And video captures have been one of the most uh, useful tools we've had in law enforcement in the last several years. So if you are victimized by a crime, or if your neighbor is, please provide that video to the investigating officers. It helps us identify suspects to put together crime alerts in which we can go out and it enhances our ability to arrest people. So there are some services. I don't you know, work for any of those companies. I don't want to push a single company, but I'm just going to talk about Ring as an example. So people have Ring cameras. When you set up your account, they do have a Ring law enforcement portal. And the Ring law enforcement portal uh, enables us to go into your Ring camera. For example, if your neighbor is, is uh, burglarized and you have a Ring camera, our detective can go and look at a map and they can uh, geofence an area and they'll have availability of all ring cameras. So like if your neighbor's house was broken into, our detective could look into your ring camera and perhaps capture footage around that time, maybe see the suspect or their vehicle. So that's just one of the, one of the uh, options out there. But that video surveillance is valuable to us, helps us solve crimes and- But can you use it to convict? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <coughs> Stephanie uh, Krudelik, asked, in light of the new threatened additional cuts to the LAPD, while crime continues to rise in Venice, what does this mean for the, the safety of residents? Well, uh, the department is, we'll, we'll have to adjust to whatever uh, budget that the city provides for us. We'll still try to do our hardest to complete our mission. Um, so what we will what we will have to look at is with our reduced resources is we're going to have to look at all of the work that we have been doing for the community and we're going to have to identify tasks that perhaps we can push off to uh, other agencies so one of the things that we looked at I've, I've mentioned this during the town hall was we the department did a study in which they looked at like eight different categories of calls for service and they broke it down by division i went through the math and looked at all of the calls that that were identified in Pacific area and about 30% of the calls that we respond to currently could theoretically be passed off to an alternate service provider. The, the question is, do those alternate service providers exist right now? And they typically don't. So if you're talking about a 415 man or a drunk man radio call that comes out on Friday at six in the evening, the, the, the police are the only people that you can call right now. So uh, if we will have a reduced budget and a reduced capability to respond we're, we're also going to have to share some of the work that we have been doing over the last decades with with other folks i'm looking forward to what other agencies are willing to take on that drunk and potentially violent person you know at nine o'clock at night 
um, but that's a rhetorical question. Um, I think I've already asked uh, Jamie Page's question, so I think that, um, unless my colleagues have some questions to ask, we are ready to move on to the next issue. Maybe we should start with um, John, with Jack, with Jack, and see if he and, and run through the committee members, see if they have any other specific questions they want to ask. You know, I'd be curious. Uh, sometimes I get a little confused with so many budget cuts and so many uh, changes due to the homeless, due to COVID. Um, so many things out there that are changing. What what would you see as is the sort of easier or or easiest thing to do to help you do your job more effectively? I we know crime is is going crazy in Venice. Um, it's it's affecting everybody. And and if you could guide us with some suggestions on where to put our efforts, part of our effort is to inform people, but part of it is maybe to inform them what they can do to help you do your job better. Well, like I said, a lot of our violent crime or more than half of it is, is driven by this in ever increasing homeless population. And if this population continues to increase, we can only expect that the amount of crime related to this population will continue, continue to increase. So perhaps the biggest uh, thing that could uh, turn this trend around would be to uh, expand homeless services. If we could stop this population or they get housed so this popul unhoused population stops growing because it's really a right now a battle for real estate. If you drive around Venice, there, there's only so many, so many sidewalks or right of ways that are desirable if you want to set up a tent and, and avoid ADA enforcement, that at some point people are fighting over sidewalk space or, or sidewalks. So we, we need to make, perhaps stop the growth of this population or get them housed, something. Thanks, and, and a sort of follow-up to that is I, I think I've heard in other discussions that the homeless population in Venice since the beginning of the year has increased about 100%. 59, 59%. 59. 57, 57, excuse me. Yeah, 57%. So, you know, we're going to have a better idea on that right um, in a couple months because uh, that 57% number was 2018 versus 2019. They're going to do the next uh, count, what is it, January 20th, I, I believe. And we're going we're to have a better idea. But anecdotally, you know, if you asked uh, Officer Crunchuris or Sergeant Skinner, they'd probably be able to give you a, a, an idea of what they predicted, maybe. Any idea? Monique, you want to throw a number up? Oh, gosh. Is it causing it? No, that's... No, that's... Thank you for reading. It's the start of year. Of homelessness. Mm. Hard to put out a number. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we'll, we'll yeah, know in a couple months. We'll have, a, we'll have a good idea in a couple months. I think traditionally, too... Yes, it feels like it's a lot more than 57. Yeah. yeah, I think traditionally, too, what's happened um, here is normally around November, you see more services downtown to mission. And because of COVID, some of those services have been cut <coughs> off. So some of the population that would normally migrate downtown has stayed in the beach area. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, Helen? Do any of my colleagues have a... Muted. Helen, you're muted. Still muted. There sorry, you go. sorry. <laughs> Uh, I would just urge us all to maybe we should probably move out of respect to our other panelists and move on to the next agenda item um, because we have a lot of other important things to talk about and hear from. So I'm going to pass on any questions. I second that. It's Eva. I, I think we're coming up again, though. And then, uh, so I think before I go, uh, Brian, uh, so Brian's here. He is a VNC board member. He represents the Oceanfront Walk. He's our expert on this. Brian, I think you had a question. Do you want to join in and ask a question uh, just related to this? Sure, I do. I believe you're overselling me as an expert, so, but uh, first and foremost, the one thing that I've been getting asked, and I'd love to ask the officers, uh, if you could give us any details about the shooting uh, this week. Uh, not only was that particularly brutal, but that was incredibly brazen. That wasn't three o'clock in the morning. That was at sunset. Uh, right on Oceanfront Walk. Uh, and what we're being told and what the press is reporting is that it was gang related. Uh, do you guys agree with that? Is that the official assessment? Uh, and if so, do you think this is something that could possibly escalate in the future? 
Okay, I do need to be a little bit vague and I can't reveal all of the details that we do have because it's an ongoing investigation. Um, but yeah, we, we do believe that, well, it, it basically involved a couple uh, supposedly from, uh, or who reported that they were from Rialto. They rented some electric scooters, went out, the electric scooters died prematurely. They came back, gone into argument with the vendor. And while they were arguing with the vendor over the premature, um, the, the scooters uh, dying, then uh, they were approached by a group of four other persons and we are saying that it's gang related only because uh, the persons in the other group asked, where are you from? Which is typically an indicator or predicate of uh, you know, gang activity. Uh, they got into an argument with that group of four people. One of, the, uh, one of the males in the group of four people produced a handgun and fired several rounds at the male, missing the male, but struck his girlfriend or, or wife. Uh, unfortunately, she stopped breathing at the scene, was transported to Ronald Reagan, where she was pronounced dead. So it is an ongoing investigation. If anybody has any information related to the shooting, uh, please share it with us, notify us. And uh, if you have any video, that'd be useful for us. And as, as far as gang activity, um, I, I looked at the numbers recently. We had 20 related uh, shots fired calls, which were related to gang members. And that is a significant increase. increase. It's over 100% increase in gang shootings but the thing that i did notice is because i looked at each one of those 20 gang related shootings and 13 of them were persons experiencing homelessness who were at some point in their life gang members so the thing that we're trying to figure out is it does none of those appear to be an increase in gang activity but we do believe that some of them are gang related because of narcotics activity and some of them are just gang related because of previous associations. Now that they've been released from jail or prison, they have difficulty finding housing. But we, there is no indicator of a gang feud or a gang war going on at Venice Beach right now. Got you. And just as a, as a quick follow up, we've, I think everyone knows we've always had our two sort of traditional gangs for decades here in Venice. Mm -hmm. I don't need to name them. Uh, but the, the sort of word on the street is that other gangs from around LA are now moving into Venice uh, to partake in the, the drug market. Uh, is that something you guys have been seeing? And is that yeah. something that might rise in the future? Uh, no, but Venice has always been a destination. So it, it's, it's someplace that people, you're gonna have people visiting from all over the county, all over the region. Therefore you have the outside gang member involvement. So our two particular gangs have, you know, defend their, their territory. And if they recognize people coming from the outside, these type of interactions occur. But it does not appear that we have Rolling 60s or 18th Street or MS trying to take over drug market out here. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. One quick question. question Alan had a questions. Yeah. No, well. Yeah. You said that the video you're looking and sourcing video that would help solve that particular crime. I know that a couple of weeks ago, uh, Councilmember Bonin's office. Had, had posted that he either invested in or repaired a number of cameras that looked like they were omnidirectional on the boardwalk. I was wondering if those are operational, if you are sourcing and have had success in sourcing content from those particular oh, yeah, omnidirectional absolutely. cameras on the boardwalk. Yeah, uh, CD11, uh, CD11 worked with us closely to fund the uh, repair of the 21 cam surveillance camera system. Uh, I think we had it repaired this this summer, and it's been very useful it's for us. It's been up and running yeah. for the last two months. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, the next the next step we'd like to take is to expand the coverage or ex expand the footprint, the surveillance footprint of that uh, of that camera system, uh, to extend all the way up to Navy and down to Washington, if we can in the future. Got it. Are Are you able to capture? Or I don't know if you're able to talk about it. Able to capture any of the footage required to help solve or? Yeah, absolutely. Help. Yeah. Okay. And, and that system such a DVR system. Uh, the the only thing that we do not have is uh, we don't have the resources to constantly monitor that system. And it's something I've been talking to Sergeant Skinner, perhaps uh, setting up some volunteer program in which we could get citizen volunteers to help us monitor that that system. Right. Well, please let us know how we can help with that. Okay. 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 All right. Are we we ready to move on to uh, item yeah. item eight? Yeah. We're now getting into the meat of it. And so I want to thank everyone, you know, for participating. 
Uh, I think we have a really great list of panelists and experts uh, to talk to us about this. And really what we see this as, as a, an opportunity to sort of engage with each other, to brainstorm, problem solve together. Um, you know, it's just, we all believe that we can do more together. And so let's do that. And to our, you know, we've got a great list of people that are here with us today. You've heard our concerns. What we want to know from you, um, just listening to everything you've heard is, you know, what is enforceable? What can we work on together? What can sort of help us with our concerns? And really it is to protect everybody in Venice. Uh, it's from, you know, our people who live here permanently, the house, it's the unhoused. We have homeless people living here. It's a big population. And then we have tourists. So what can we do together to ensure the public health and safety of every single person in Venice? And I think that we can work on that together. So what we're gonna do for this uh, you know, section is, first we're going to ask, uh, so Brian, he is, uh, he is a VNC member. He's on the Oceanfront Walk Committee. And he's really gonna explain to everybody how, you know, Venice is so different because, you know, we host the world, we're a tourist destination. He'll, he will share some concerns that he's faced, you know, just being on the Oceanfront Walk. And then from there, we'll move on to Parks and Rec. And we just like, you know, maybe five minutes, tell us a little about, you know, what you guys do, uh, you know, just address some concerns and maybe tell us, you know, what's enforceable, what we can work on together. And maybe you can offer a few suggestions. Uh, from there, we'll go on to LA Sanitation. Uh, again, the same thing, you know, just address some of our concerns, tell us what we can work on together, what's enforceable. From there, we'll go back to LAPD. Uh, we'd like the same question and we'll end it with uh, the council member's office. Uh, basically, how can you work to be the quarterback and work with us and take everything that we've heard, you know, under concern and, you know, how can you really quarterback this whole thing and work with us? And so with that, Brian, uh, it's now up to you. So go ahead. Sure. sure. That was quite an intro. So um, my name is Brian. I know most of you. Uh, I am on the Oceanfront Walk Committee. Uh, I do live about 20 yards from Oceanfront Walk and I spend a lot of time on there. So I think I have a, a pretty good handle on it. I, I wouldn't go expert. Um, the, the feedback that we tend to get on that committee focuses on public safety. So I'm gonna sort of speak for the business owners and the residents who live in and around Oceanfront Walk. Um, we just talked about that shooting, uh, so I'm not, I'm not specifically talking about housed or unhoused people, uh, but more the general level of violence that's that's sort of taking place now. Uh, obviously, it's it's completely unacceptable. Uh, and one important thing is that it's it's destroying businesses, uh, businesses that have been on oceanfront walk for decades, restaurants, bars. I know a bunch of the restaurant bar owners. Uh, these guys are getting crushed. People are just afraid to come out to Oceanfront Walk. And now, especially that it's getting dark at five o'clock, uh, businesses are being destroyed. Um, so what we're asked and what I would ask uh, is, is basically just for more of a, a, some sort of police or security presence on the boardwalk. Uh, I feel like, like a brazen shooting like that would not have taken place if there was more of a, a, a visible police presence on the boardwalk. Uh, and it's, it's a unique place in that everything about Venice is there. We've got the, the beach, the parks, the tourists, residents, bars, businesses. So it's all focused there, sort of our, our little jewel of Venice. So I think we as a committee just feel very strongly that somehow, I know that there's budget cuts and there's a lack of resources, but there needs to be more of a police presence on the boardwalk just to sort of dissuade this sort of brazen criminal criminal activity. Um, just a quick story. I went surfing this morning at about 8.30 and there was one guy chasing another guy right down the middle of the boardwalk with a baseball bat. And sadly enough, that seemed, that seemed like a normal Venice morning to me. <laughs> um, so the feedback that we get on that committee, that's generally the gist of it. Uh, just more of a police presence it is sort of our, our crown jewel over here at the beach. And in the interests of residents and businesses, uh, the unhoused who are also being abused, uh, 
more police presence would go a, a very long way. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but things, things out there are becoming palpably more violent. Uh, just as someone who's out there a lot, day and night, uh, it's getting genuinely scary. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about the unhoused or the housed. Uh, I feel like a lot of the sort of frightening element uh, is coming in to fill a, a, a security vacuum, if you will, that's on the boardwalk. Uh, and if there's gonna be guys with guns on the boardwalk, I would much rather that they are LAPD officers. That's, that's about it for me. Okay. Thanks, so. Uh, so thank you, Brian. And I just wanna make uh, just one update. So after we get through you know, our, our speakers, we will open it up for public comment. Uh, so raise your hand, you know, we'll have a minute there and then we'll open up to committee discussion. Uh, but from here, I'd like to invite Parks and Rec uh, to come on and, you know, you, you just heard from Brian, you've heard, you know, you've sat with us for, you know, thank you, it's been an hour and a half. So, you know, so what, what do you guys think? Uh, you know, what can we work on together? What's enforceable? How can we sort of work towards these goals to, you know, ensuring public safety and the health for everybody here? He needs to be unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Jimmy Kim, I'm the superintendent of recreation and parks. I oversee emergency management, uh, as well as the citywide aquatics division. Um, so I want to first thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to address this committee. Um, so rec and parks oversees uh, the properties along oceanfront park, uh, oceanfront walk, uh, the fishing pier, windward plaza, and the recreation center um, uh, from about Navy to about Washington. So that's uh, our area of responsibility. Um, in terms of the uh, cleanups and, and the homeless related issues, um, based on the CDC's recommendation to allow uh, people who are living in encampments to remain where they are during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the department has taken the position of following that recommendation and not displacing individuals in encampments across all of Rec and Park properties. Um, Rec and Parks does, however, uh, enforce the 6344 uh, Municipal Code uh, and the removal of encampments in very high fire um, hazard severity zones, uh, which uh, is identified by the Los Angeles Fire Department. Um, there are no uh, very high fire severity zones in the Verdon Beach uh, neighborhood areas. I just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that. Um, in terms of uh, recreation and parks, we will perform uh, in what we call uh, comprehensive cleanups. Uh, if, and, and these are the, 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 the reason why we would do this, is if the encampment is blocking uh, a path of travel um, or obstructs the ability for city workers to perform repairs. Uh, if it is the latter case, um, rec and parks will coordinate with uh, the city department so that um, you know, when we do our cleanup immediately following, we can do our repairs. Um, if the encampment is obstructing the use of an open amenity, uh, which at this time, uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 protocols, none of the amenities are open. Um, if we were to remove an encampment because of an open amenity, uh, the three, we need three conditions uh, to exist. So for, for us to do that cleanup, uh, the first one is um, our uh, partners over at the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority. Uh, we give them the opportunity to go in and perform outreach. Uh, we are also looking uh, for them to have a bona fide offer of housing, especially during times of COVID-19. Um, and the other option is, or the other component is, uh, we work closely with our partners over at Sanitation uh, to assist us with uh, the storage of personal property. Recreation and Parks does not have uh, personal property storage uh, uh, capabilities. And so we, we lean heavily on LA sanitation. Um, Rec and Parks will enforce uh, voluntary compliance of 6344 uh, and discarding of bulky items, which we have done uh, in the past. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to give you a quick overview of, 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 our, of our current positions um, and answer some questions if you guys have them. So do you, do you want questions for each speaker or do you want to wait till we've heard from all. 
Soledad, you're um, muted. Well, in the absence of our chair, I'd, I would like to follow up with Mr. Kim. Um, I, I sent him an email earlier today um, pointing out that his department does enforce 6344 in the San Pedro area. And that comes directly from the councilman there, um, Mr. Buscaino. So I am uh, troubled by the disparity in enforcement. There is, if you go to uh, Cabrillo uh, Beach Park, it's a very large park, large grassy areas. Um, if you go to the Point Furman Park, also large grassy areas, um, there is not one camper, one private stored possession, uh, not one tent. So I, I would ask Mr. Kim why the department is not acting city, uh, on a citywide application of 6344. Your own park ranger, Joe Losarelli, the chief park ranger, enforces 6344 in the Westminster Senior Park, which is two blocks from the beach. So why is it that Mr. Losarelli is given authority to enforce uh, 6344 and to keep the park open and available for the public, but not allowed to enforce the same law two blocks away at Venice Beach? And then I just make the footnote that CDC doesn't say go to the park, go to the beach. CDC says, stay where you are. The bulk of people that are now lining Oceanfront Walk and camping there were not there two months ago or three months ago. So they have already violated CDC guidelines and moved, in many cases, moved away from the known location that their service provider knows. So that it, it, it doesn't, all we're doing is creating more and more um, of an encampment here that creates more and more of the crime that the officers have said tonight they can't keep up with. So to address your question about CD15 and Cabrillo Beach, um, I can assure you that Rec and Parks uh, does not, uh, in fact, uh, uh, go in to enforce 6344 in, in the manner that you're describing. Um, we do go in there to do voluntary compliance. Uh, there's other law enforcement agencies such as the Port Police uh, that, that uh, we're actually a tenant on the, the property uh, over at Cabrillo Beach that may go in and do uh, enforcement. But in terms of our park rangers, uh, we, we do not go into uh, those areas to do enforcement. There are certain areas in Cabrillo Beach or in San Pedro um, that are within the very high fire severity zone. So we do have the authority to go in and, and do those uh, because of the very high fire threat. Um, so we have gone in to do those type of enforcement. Um, in terms of Westchester or Westminster Park, Westminster, um, Westminster Park, uh, the, only, the, the rationale that I could give to that, um, I haven't uh, spoken to the chief on, on that uh, specific area. But the rationale is that if the encampment is blocking the path of travel um, or the amenity um, and the facility is open, then we will go in and do a, a, an enforcement and, and follow our, our protocols in terms of the removal of, uh, uh, of the encampment. Um, but again, again, we, when we do that, there are specific uh, requirements that, that we have to go. And, and I'm assuming that the, when the chief does go in, um, is, is to try to get voluntary compliance. Um, we have gone to Venice uh, and tried to do voluntary compliance, but I think as everybody knows, um, very often uh, they don't really comply. So um, hopefully that answers your question. I'd like to ask a question. Um, I, I think what you're hearing in, from, from this committee is generally it's getting crime and general lawlessness is getting to such an extent that people aren't using the beach. So when you say blocking access, the threat of violence is so severe at times, we can't use our own beach. To me, that's blocking access. Just because they don't 
block a, 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 this, the, and, and I'm not saying everybody, but I'm, I'm, it's a condition of violence now. And I think what have, or are you doing as a department to realize that, that this high level of violence is stopping people accessing you know, one of the treasures of Venice, of Los Angeles? So we are continually working with our partners over at the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority uh, that does the, the outreach. Um, and, and really that is kind of our gate, gatekeepers in terms of us being able to go in and do a, uh, a cleanup. Uh, so we are working with them to try to identify, um, again, a, a bona fide offer of housing um, so that we can uh, strategize and, and be able to exit the people uh, in, in that area. But um, as you know, and, and across the city, uh, the, the housing crisis is real. Um, and, and so it's very difficult to, to be able to um, offer that. So um, not only are we working with um, the, the LASA, uh, that's their uh, that's what it's what they call themselves, LASA, um, as well as the council offices to try to um, identify housing so we could go ahead and do those type of removals. So the, the, the large level of violence has nothing, it, it isn't a concern of yours? Um, of course it's a concern, but again, you know, we, uh, because of the, the, uh, the COVID crisis, um, you know, we are trying to uh, get them housing first uh, before we do any type of removal. Um, okay, so I am going to, uh, I, I think we in the interest of time, we need to move on to LA Sanitation, um, just so we can get a response from them, and then move on to Councilmember Bonin's office to figure out how, you know, we can really work together to quarterback all of this, and then we'll open up for public comment, and then from there, we'll go back to a committee discussion, and we'll all be able to, um, you know, ask some questions, so thank you, everyone. So from there, uh, you know, who do we have from LA San? Let's get our experts on to talk to us. All right, let's unmute you. Okay. Hi everyone, it's, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sometimes this mic is a little uh, fussy. So it's really great to be here with you tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Pam Perez. I'm the head of marketing for LA San. I know that has absolutely nothing to do with safety, um, but in addition to filling our marketing role of doing our branding and social media, um, just about anything digital, I'm also um, temporarily filling our role of neighborhood council liaison because um, as some of you know Daniel Tam, who was in that role previously, he worked for me and Daniel left the city in June. So um, I'm just stepping in during the city's hiring freeze until we can find someone else um, to work with the neighborhood council. So I, I'm your gal, you can come to me for whatever you need. Um, in marketing, I don't really know all the details about everything. I know just enough to be dangerous, but I do know who all the people are so I can get you connected to the people that you need to talk to. Um, so I can't solve your issues, unfortunately, but I, I can help or do my best to help anyway. If I don't have the answers, I'll find them. Um, the things that I wanna to mention tonight, and then I'm, I'm gonna ask Ruben to speak because Ruben is the one who's actually out there in the field working um, in, in all of these situations. I just want to remind everybody, the best way that you can help us is to report things in the MyLA311 app and to use our 800 number, which is 1-800-773-2489. That 800 number is staffed 24-7. You can call at 3 in the morning. You can call on Christmas. You can call anytime you want. We're open 365 days a year. Um, people get confused sometimes because they say, gosh, you know, your, your truck just went by and we saw you stop and pick up that mattress, but you left the refrigerator. What gives? What's your problem? Why can't you pick it all up? We have different trucks for different commodities because all of those things go to different places. So that um, that refrigerator may be going to a place where the pipe, the parts can better be recycled. The mattress would be going to a place where the metal can be recycled. Um, and maybe the rest of the debris is trash and needs to be picked up by a different truck that's going to the landfill. So. Um, that's kind of why you'll see multiple trucks out there. But um, it, people complain too, you know, your, your truck just went by this mess and how do you guys not know this mess is here? Those guys that are driving the trucks, they're just, they're driving all day long. And if they stop to write down something every time they saw it, they, I, I know it sounds like a cop out and I do apologize for that, but they just can't. We'll never get anything done if we stop every time we need to write something down. And that's where my LA 311 came from. We really need the public to assist us and tell us, hey, there's an issue over here. There's an issue over here. My LA 311 is the app that's used by all of the city departments, 
or most of the city departments um, to take in service requests. And we shuffle them back and forth between departments then. So maybe we get something and we say, gosh, that's not us. That's our friends at street services. Internally, we'll shift it over to street services instead of telling the resident, nope, that's not ours. Sorry, can't help. Um, so that's really important for everybody to just use that app. You can actually upload your photos into it so we can see what's going on and see what you see. Um, you can put in an exact address. You can, um, there, there's just so many different things that you can do in there. Let us know if your trash hasn't been picked up because we don't want those bins sitting out too late. Um, it, it, that's really the, the gist of it. You're gonna see some campaigns coming out from me over the next year, we're doing a Watch Your Waste campaign to um, work on source reduction, and help people understand what can and can't be recycled, when we can reuse, when we can reduce. Um, all of that will be coming out. You'll be hearing more about food waste. Um, I feel like I'm just kind of rambling now. I'm gonna let, if there's one other thing I wanna say, it's just that um, people are also confused about what we do. It's not our role to move the homeless or to eradicate the homeless or, or, or do anything like that. You know, these are human beings. Our role is to protect public health and the environment. So we come out, we ask them, would you please move so that we can clean? We come in, we carry out the debris, we store what they need to be, what they need stored. We sanitize what we can and we move on. I understand that's a little bit different right now and, and Ruben could speak to the actual protocols um, during this pandemic. But I just want to be clear that, that that's really our role. We leave all of the, um, the services for our unsheltered neighbors to LASA for them to handle that. And um, LAPD has been wonderful in helping us with enforcement because that, that too is not our role. Okay, great. And so who, uh, so is Ruben here? Let's, why don't we ask him to speak? Ruben is here. I think he's there under Sandstar. Alan, do you see him anywhere? Yeah, he's ac he's actually in the uh, in the attendees, so I'm actually going to promote him to a panelist. Perfect. Look at that, Ruben! You got a promotion tonight. Small victories, Ruben. And then I have to uh, ask him to unmute. Is he still around? I asked him to unmute, but I don't see him unmuting or showing his video. Oh, he's unmuted. Hi, everybody. There he is. Here we go. Okay. Hi. Everybody, you hear me okay? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us here, LA Sanitation. Uh, again, uh, I just want to reiterate what Pamela said. Again, our, our main goal is to uh, protect uh, public health as well as the environment. Um, again, you know, as, a, as we're, we're all aware and what we've been discussing pretty much uh, tonight is, you know, with the COVID, there are some changes that, are, that have been made in regards to how sanitation is conducting um, operations out in the field. Uh, first and foremost, I'd, I'd like to say that we focus on being very safe out there as well as being very efficient uh, for the uh, for the public as well as, you know, all the stakeholders, uh, constituents, and very much for the unhoused as well. So again, um, our main goal right now is to go out and service these locations that we're working with the council district. Um, in scheduling on a weekly basis. And we're out there to provide services, which include the removal of trash and debris, uh, the removal of line of sight hazards, as well as we are also implementing some services like the MHU unit, the mobile hygiene unit for uh, showers, as well as providing hygiene kits for the unhoused, as well as we just recently had a, a, a blanket drive that we were out there today providing blankets out for the unhoused at the ABH zone. And again, uh, we are asking for voluntary compliance. Um, we are taking a, a really service-based approach here. Uh, we're working with LASA, we're working with our partners, we're working with LAPD, we're working with St. Joseph's, and we're having some really good interactions out there, really keeping the stress levels down out there, especially for the unhoused as well as the staff out there during these, these times. Um, I can report today that, that we were at third and rose today and we had some very good success in regards to 
getting voluntary compliance with the individuals out there, as well as being able to remove a lot of trash and debris that they were also willing to give up some of their personal belongings that they didn't want anymore as well. So we're out there making sure that we're, we're taking care of the biohazards that we encounter at these encampments. We're, we're, we're educating the individuals out there in regards to compliance, in regards to ADA, ingress, egress. Uh, we're taking a look and making sure that we're, we're looking out for ignitables right now, especially right now with the current uh, influx of encampments that are, that are you know, having some fire issues. We're taking a look and making sure that we're, we're addressing those, those, um, those hazards. Um, again, with the, with the Venice Beach uh, scheduled uh, uh, services every Friday, uh, Again, I do agree it is, there has been a large amount of uh, encampments moving in in that area. Uh, I think the last time uh, we did a tally about a week ago, it's close to about 150 encampments. Uh, so we are out there every Friday morning from about seven to about 10 to 10.30 a.m. Um, we are going out there, we're talking to the individuals, we're trying to get them to, uh, provide us with voluntary, <clears throat> excuse me, tr voluntary trash removal. Uh, we're, we're out there looking for the line of sight hazards, as well as working with our partnering agencies and making sure that the unhoused are getting some services out there as well. So uh, with that said, um, I'm open to some discussions in regards to anything that you guys have in mind. Thank you, thank you so much, Ruben. Uh, so now at this point, um, I'd like to Take it back. We'll go back to LAPD. From there, we will go back. We will ask. Um, we will give Councilmember Mike Bonin's office the ability to kind of give in their thoughts. Uh, you know how they can quarterback that. From there, we'll go on to public comment, and then from there, we will go to you know committee member questions. And so, as I go to LAPD, because you guys are going to wrap it up, and then you know we'll talk to the council member's office. Uh, you know, wh what I hear from everyone is we're going to reimagine public safety. And that sounds really great. It sounds like something fun that you would do. You know, it sounds like something that maybe I would have done in college. But today, what I'm hearing from everyone is we don't have time to reimagine public safety. Uh, we need to provide real solutions that keeps people safe because people's you know lives are at risk. And so as we go back to this, uh, you've heard all of our concerns. Instead of reimagining public safety, from what you've heard from people, how do we protect the health and well being of everyone inside of Venice, whether it's a permanent resident, a homeless person, or a tourist? So let's go back to you guys, give us some feedback, and then we'll move to the council member's office to kind of figure out how we can quarterback this. So go ahead. Yeah. yeah Hi, so, so it's Senior Lead mm -hmm. Officer Monique Contreras, and I just wanted to kind of wrap it up and just give a little bit of overview of some of the things I've seen some of the feedback that we've gotten from officers and community members in general. Um, so I know there's a complete, um, a lot of frustration um, from community members on the boardwalk about the things that they're seeing, um, enforcement efforts and uh, so forth. And so what I try to tell the residents is that LAPD is just one piece of the puzzle, right? And so when we do things to address things on the boardwalk, um, whether it be 6344, we do need a partnership of the other um, agencies, city and county partners. And at this point, it, it does feel like we're lacking that partnership. Um, I talked to some of the beach officers tonight and one of their frustrations in regards to outreach, a definite lack of mental health services and outreach in general. Um, those officers that are working at two in the morning, um, three in the morning, whatever it may be, they don't have anybody to turn to, um, to provide services to. Um, there seems to be um, no um, information um, that's trickling down to us about the outreach services. Um, one of the questions that came up is what happened to winter shelter? Um, mm -hmm. When is the bus returning? That is not happening at this time. Uh, there is one bus that uh, is supposed to pick up. Um, it's a van with a limited amount of space. Um, often that bus is full by the time it makes it to Pacific Division. So those things in regards to outreach and those officers really want to help, wanting to help those individuals, it takes a lot of our time. And we, we are really looking forward to those teams. Um, in regards to mental health services, um, definitely lacking. Um, we try to build that collaboration and partnership. Um, a lot of the times they won't address anybody until they, they reach the, that, that, that stage.
stage where their mental capacity is beyond. Um, so in, in regards to that, um, it, it's a frustration for the beach. And in regards to enforcement, um, it's hard for us to address anything on the boardwalk um, and enforce. For us, it's a citation or arrest. Um, but we're missing that partnership of, of rec and parks and sanitation and addressing property. And I think that's what the community um, needs to understand is that for LAPD, we can address the person um, and the, the criminal um, element. But when it comes to property, that is definitely something that rec and parks and LA San needs to take part of. Um, we're happy to collaborate with both of those departments. Um, and, and that's pretty much just an overview of some of the things that I've seen. Um, okay, uh, so Nisa, are, are you ready to sort of weigh in uh, just everything you've heard? You're representing the council members district. You know, just, you know, how, how can we all work together to quarterback this? How can we provide safety for every single person in Venice? Thanks, Soledad. Uh, first, I want to just say thank you because I think this is an incredibly important conversation. And I think a lot of what I've been trying to tell everyone during the monthly board meetings and other committee meetings about what other departments are doing and what they cannot do, um, you were able to hear from the horse's mouth tonight. So I think that's, that's very important um, that this discussion takes place and you realize that everyone is in a, a, a hard place right now with what they're capable of doing, um, but they do have some capabilities and now you know what those are. So um, as far as quarterbacking, I, I mean, I've never played football, but I will do my best here. Um, you know, it's conversations like this need to continue to happen. Um, I've had a, a few uh, with, with Rex and Park and these departments um, specific to Oceanfront Walk recently because we've seen a shift. A lot of our time was spent over at Rose Penmar when that initiative took place and that we now have a, a deep breath to, to refocus our efforts um, now that that has been successful. And, you know, COVID is a complication. Um, I'd like to be walking along the boardwalk with everyone, um, a big group of people as often as possible, but we, um, we just can't do that as often. So um, we need to figure out um, how to do this more often, I think with the community, because just, talking amongst ourselves as agencies, uh, we don't get the same perspective as when we hear the feedback from our constituents. So when someone like Brian Averill says, um, we're not seeing a police presence on the boardwalk, you know, I'd like to know more about what that means. You know, I'm, I'm sure they're out there. Are we talking about, you know, on foot along Oceanfront Walk? Is that something that the community would like to see more of? Uh, that's an important discussion that's going to come from the people that are looking out their windows every day. Um, so let's let's keep doing it. I think, you know, I, I, on the spot right now, I can't tell you uh, what the the magic um, the magic wand um, being waved around Venice can can get done. It's a matter of of collaboration. So, um, I've been saying that word for a really long time. And I think you creating this meeting is, is the beginning of that uh, from a stakeholder's point of view. So uh, I would say, would you be willing to do this again? You know, I, would you be willing to get everyone together again and maybe have more community feedback about what they would like to see as well? Um, you know, we reimagining public safety is, is incredibly important. Um, and, and Chief Moore made that really clear in his public safety uh, town hall with the councilman. It's, I think it's the word reimagine, unfortunately is, it means it hasn't happened just yet, but you know we have to get there. And we still do have LAPD um, working with our community. And the councilman works very closely with LAPD. He doesn't direct them as to what to do. That is, you know, that is something that comes from within their office, from the chief, from the captains making those decisions. So um, just, just know that I'm, I, you know, from our office, we don't quarterback LAPD. We, you know, we communicate with them. 
Um, and, you know, the cuts that people are talking about, please do remember that there's been a 1% cut to LAPD where other departments like LA Sanitation have taken a much bigger cut. Um, so, you know, thank you to, to those who are still out there doing the job um, with, those, with those cuts, but we need to all make sure that we're working to the best of our capacity at this time. Um, you know, our office as well, taking furloughs. Like I've said, I, I work even harder the days that I'm not furloughed because that is my job as a public servant. So I just, I hope that all of our other departments can do the same thing. Dexter, I don't, do you wanna add something? I'm comfortable with exactly what you said, Nisa, and I second every single part of it. Uh, well, thank wow, you, Dexter. Thank you. But just in the interest of time, and Nisa, thank you so much. You know, it's 6.52. Uh, so now we are going to, uh, we're gonna move on to public comment. Um, let me share my screen. If you, we're going to give a max of 10 minutes, you'll have one minute each. And these are for basically agendized items. We're not voting on anything tonight, but you know, basically talk to us about what you believe, uh, you know, when we're talking about, you know, enforcement coordination issues. And so with that, we will go to public comment. And then after that, we will then go back to committee member comment. And we'll all, we'll all be asking you guys uh, just some final questions and, you know, thank you. This this night has gone on a little bit longer than we expected, but thank you so much for all being here. And with that, uh, let me figure out how to go. Sorry, we we just took these trainings. Uh, let me figure out how to go back to my my clock. Um, so there's one, two, three, four, five people so far with public comment. We're gonna cut it off probably in the next I don't know ten seconds or so. So if you do want to make public comment please raise your hand. Um, and remember everyone, you can always email us. We want to hear from you. Public safety at VeniceNC.org. Uh, if we have not gotten to your comment, you know, this meeting, we want, we will make sure to get to it at another time. So. Okay. okay. The last person that we have right now is Lisa Redmond. So we're going to cut it off at Lisa Redmond. So Lisa Redmond is the last person to comment. First up, um, if we're ready for public comment, is going to be Nick Antonicello. Uh, apologies if I butchered that, but I'm going to um, allow to talk. So Nick, state your name and we'll start the clock for you. Uh, Nick Antonicello, 30 year resident of Venice. Uh, what I heard tonight is very disturbing. The experts are telling everybody that homelessness is the driving force for rising crime in Venice. And we have a political councilman who talks about reimagining uh, public policy and political rhetoric so extreme, it's disturbing to anyone who lives here. What I will say to you is this, is that the encampments need to go. Stan Muhammad at the homeless meeting the other night said that half the encampments in Venice are now dwellings for drug dealership. If that's not a reason to take down these encampments, I don't know what is. And using CDC guidelines as an excuse not to disturb these areas when clearly sanitation can't get in there and clean it. Is 10 it seconds. So please, let's, let's talk to reality and stop the political rhetoric. Um, all right, Alan, who is up next? You're muted, Alan. Apologies, we have Steve. Okay, Steve, go ahead, say your name, and we'll start the clock for you. Steve Ironlui, can you hear me? All right, yep. go ahead, Steve. Okay, yeah, you know, I agree with what Nick said, a lot of what Nick said. I would let, I'd be curious how we could, uh, how as citizens we could vote to divert money back to LAPD and get more police out here. I mean, this, we are, we are like, like I said, I've been here 15 years and this is unprecedented what's going on here. We have crime on top of crime. It's, it's now a daily occurrence where there's choppers, fires, shootings. I mean, we are just at a completely different city than we were two, three years ago. I mean, I, is there an initiative? Is there a way to get money diverted back to LAPD so they can actually have a presence here on the boardwalk? Because the criminality wherever it's stemming from isn't really relevant. But I mean, to say that it's not 
something that doesn't need more police presence is I don't know I don't I see how that's tenable with what's going on in Venice. You know I think I think we need the police I think we need more police presence and I think we need to figure out how to get money back to them. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, who's up, Ellen? Next up is uh, Gloria Romero. All right, Gloria, please state your name and then we'll give you a minute. Uh, hello, it's Gloria Romero. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for meeting. I've learned a lot this evening. I do reside in Venice and have family. I am concerned about the report of the 300 homicides already in Los Angeles. And I'm deeply concerned in this so-called reimagining that our councilman is pushing that it's on the backs of women. Uh, I am concerned about sexual assault. I am appalled at how they are talking about domestic violence and basically you send a social worker, uh, not a police officer to, to apprehend the suspect. So I, I'm wondering uh, if we should start advertising that, you know, come to Venice and if you're raped, who do we turn to? Do we, do we go to our, our mayor and our councilman? Because I think as women, we really need to rise up and discuss this. I appreciate the police really also linking. It's not just about homelessness, but about mental health, drug, increased crime overall. And that's why this issue is of such importance to all of us. Thank you. And let's get better leadership in our city. Thanks so much, Gloria. Um, Ellen, who next, do we have next? Yeah, next up is uh, Sean O'Brien. All right, Sean, go ahead, state your name, and we'll start the clock for you. Uh, yes, hi, this is Sean O'Brien. A uh, couple things. Uh, with sanitation, Rick Swinger uh, championed an effort to get rat-proof trash cans over on 3rd Street. Uh, that was years ago. Why are those rat-proof trash cans non-existent? The money's been allocated. Please look into that. Uh, with Parks and Rec, I don't know why that uh, uh, Mr. Kim stated that Parks and Rec will enforce voluntary enforcement of 6344. How is it both enforcement and, and voluntary and enforced? So that doesn't make sense. Uh, one thing that really gets me is when you talk about the usage of the boardwalk. The boardwalk is a unique place that it's a free speech zone. With all these encampments, they've blocked the free speech zone. They've blocked my right for free to assemble at the boardwalk for free speech. So I've lost two of my, my constitutional rights. I can't, I don't have my free speech zone and I can't assemble there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. Next up is gonna be uh, Shante Hardesty. All right, uh, uh, go ahead, state your name and I'll start the clock for you. Hi there, I'm Shante Hardesty. I was raised in Venice, I'm 53. I've been here all my life. Um, I don't feel safe in my home anymore. Parks and Recs, you say that the, you, it's shelter in place due to the CVC, you don't live here. Try walking down our block and try walking to the beach and be um, approached by homeless by violence and then you sanitation goes and gives them a blanket. You're, where are our homeowners rights? We lost our rights it seems. It seems like um, the homeless are being treated as homeowners. They don't pay property taxes. We're being invaded, violated and no one seems to care. I mean, we can talk and go around in circles but you still, you know, nobody cares. Nobody is protecting us. And minute by minute we're being robbed, we're being we're being ab ab abused, everything. Homeless are walking all over us. We need help, Parks and Recs. We need help now. Thank you so much. Um, Ellen, uh, who's next? Next up is uh, Gordon Potter. All right, go ahead, state your name and we'll get the clock started for you. Uh, yeah, my name's Gordon. Uh, wow, tough to follow up uh, the homeowner's rights advocate there, that is. Wow, that is some just terrible hate-filled stuff. Um, you know, Nisa Dexter, you guys have the patience of a saint for sitting through this. Just quick shout out to you guys. Um, yeah, but I would I want to encourage this committee to maybe bring in some strong voices. Um, and this happens every time there's discussion about the sort of failures of the LAPD um, over the decades. I mean, we've been increasing their budget for decades and decades and decades. We didn't cut it this year. We just didn't increase it. Um, but I really appreciate it. I think this committee should bring in some voices to really speak to that instead of providing, you know, 
this happens every time LAPD comes in, they blame rising crime on their and their failures on budget cuts that are non-existent. They sit in front of a horribly racist blue lives matter flag this entire time, which is particularly disgusting. Um, so maybe just bring in some other voices as well. Uh, Ellen, who's next? Thanks so much. And then last up is Lisa Redmond. Okay, Lisa, go ahead, state your name and we'll get the clock started for you. Well, Ellen just state, <laughs> Ellen did just state my name. Uh, to Mr. O'Brien's point, I hope he understands the irony that unhoused people also have the right to assemble and have the ability to speak as well for First Amendment constitutional rights. But I really wanted to speak tonight and uplift Ruben Hernandez and his sanitation crew and uh, Dexter O'Connell the, in the council's office uh, that we are working together and that they have brought uh, advocates in as well to show that we really can all work together and get sanitation done, get ADA compliance. It was an incredibly wonderful morning and everyone is welcome to come out to the enforcement zone any Thursday morning and see this work being done. Okay, thank you so much. We just, just, just ended. Um, all right, so we'll end public comment. Um, now I'm going to, we're now going up to a uh, committee discussion. And so from here, we'll go to our committee members. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for, you know, really being here to listen to all of our concerns. You've heard from so many different people today. You've, uh, you, you've heard from uh, residents, uh, you've heard all of our concerns. You now understand how, you know, unique Venice is where we are, I think we're 3.5 miles wide. Uh, you know, but we're the small neighborhood, but we host the world. And we have such a wide array of residents here and just people here on a daily basis. And so with that, I wanna open this back up to committee, uh, committee discussion, uh, committee members, let's get your questions for all of our panelists. And so uh, who start, so John, why don't you start off for us? Um, one of my questions is I, I understand that, that we have severe budget cuts and there's constraints left, right and center. But if you look at the percentage that we reduce the police force in Venice from 42 to 26, it's a massive reduction. And at the same time, we have a spike in violence. We have uh, an increasing homeless population. It seems like all, everything's going the wrong direction. And that's pretty clear what's happening is, is crime and violence is going up. I think you've heard a number of people throughout the community express just, just how dramatic and the, the change is. But I don't understand, um, and then this is for you, Nissa. I don't understand, is there more of a push? I don't understand, it seems like there's more of a budget cut in Venice than there is other places. And I'm curious about the councilman's position on that because I just don't know what his position is. But I do feel like we're in a crisis state and going from 42 to 26 police is, I'm surprised it didn't go the other way. Um. So I'll just reiterate that the council office does not instruct LAPD on on where they put their their police force or um, it's that that would you would want to be talking to the captains and probably um, Sergeant Cook about how they decide where they they put their details. I, I understand that you don't decide, but I'm curious what your recommendations are to them. Is he made a public statement that this is ludicrous? or he's mute on the point or? No, or we free. had, he he made a specific ask after, you know, we have the amount of concern coming in to the community mm -hmm. that we feel like we need more coverage in Venice. So that was a, a specific ask. There were the budget cuts that took a cut to where they could put their office officers and how many they could have. And that took us down to 16. Um, and so from the public safety town hall and the months previous to it and the councilman's discussions with Chief Moore, that's how we got back up to 26. So that there was, there were more officers put in place because of those concerns. 
So he he's satisfied with 20. Well, given all the constraints, and, and trust me, I understand there's a lot of constraints. It's even overwhelming how many constraints there are. But he's satisfied with the 26, or is he continuing to push for more? Or what's, what's he his... doesn't really ask for the number. He, you know, the community concerns and what we're seeing with crime, that is something we can convey to LAPD and the chief and the captains, but it is ultimately their decision. Um, what they decide to provide and what they think is appropriate from the data they have. Okay, and there, there have been recent discussions on that? And that's how we that, got to 26? Yes, that's how we got from 16 to 26. And that was recently, I'm wondering if there's more push from all these these, these meetings and more more uh, recent murders. And I mean, it does even feel like it's getting worse in the last couple of weeks. Well, it was over the past month. So it was very, very recent that he okay. had conversations with the chief. So whether there will be more after, you know, of the recent homicide, um, that's yet to be determined. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. You're welcome. Um, okay, who's up next in our committee alphabetically? Um, yeah. Ellen is next. Yeah. Okay. Eva, I think. Eva, you go first. Okay, sure. No, you go. Okay, I'll go. Okay, if if we if at the police say we have over fifty percent of the homeless in, in the encampments are engaging in criminal activities, I do not understand how we are discussing voluntarily voluntary compliance with them. You're asking people who are engaging in criminal activity to voluntarily comply on sanitation, etc. The absurdity, and this I think is the frustration of this community. It's just so absurd that though you aren't you aren't dealing with those people, that you're defending their right to be in these encampments, to engage in these activities, to have these uh, you know chop shops and to deal the drugs. Do something about them, and then the remainder of the population. I'm willing to listen that these are people down on their luck but I'm not willing to listen to the excuses made for criminals. Uh, I don't hear how, how many people voluntarily comply. There's a lot of talk of that by your office, Nissa. You know, oh, well, we get voluntary compliance. Well, is this 25%? Is this 50%? Is it 75% of the people that you're going out and asking to move their things or shift them around so they can clean? Do they, you know, and my other question is, when the police say they aren't getting the support for the mental health services that are needed, et cetera, and they refer to LASA, is that the program that has been turned over to St. Joseph's Center? Is that who we're relying on, an organization that's closed in the evenings and then closed on the weekends? Is that who has, that's who has the contract for the homeless? So is that the equivalent? And whoever can answer that question, feel free. I'll, I'll respond to the mental health piece of it. I was just going to say um, to Soledad for, for the next meeting, it would be, um, I think it would be helpful to have, I know you had the Department of Public Health, but it would be very, very helpful to have the Department of Mental Health because that would be under the county. And um, they do have a field rep who is basically, you know, my capacity for their office. Uh, that would be, especially because LAPD as well is feeling desperate for that for that resource. So they should definitely be involved in this. Um, and when you you spoke of voluntary compliance, um, I think I was confused because I know that uh, Rex and Park used that phrase as well. Um, but are you speaking about the cleaning right now in the SECZ? I'm speaking about the cleaning because your office uses that term too. I've heard it from Dexter, so. Oh, okay, so yeah. yes, that's that's why I was confused. Um, Rexon Park, I think, does the same thing uh, up on Oceanfront Walk, but in the SECZ zone, which Dexter is the field deputy for, um, that's, that's what we're working on, resuming cleanings and getting uh, voluntary compliance because what was happening in the rest of the city is that they were going in with comprehensives and there was a lot of sweeping taking place. People's belongings, important papers, sometimes tents that were only an inch or two over ADA were just being taken. Um, uh, medicine was being taken, they were sweeping through. It may look pretty afterwards to some people, but it, it victimized a lot of a very vulnerable community. So we wanted to make sure we, and we were in there cleaning again, which is why uh, Dexter is out there every Thursday today with LA Sanitation, which I heard was incredibly successful. So that is great. Thank you, Ruben, for that. Um, they 
they do ask for voluntary compliance because there have been issues with forcing people to, to give up things. Um, it leads to <laughs> mental health crises. It leads to, like I said, taking of belongings. So um, that's the voluntary compliance part. And, and it's, I think, a matter of doing it more and gaining trust with that population. And when, and you can see how it happened today, they've been doing it, um, Dexter, tell me for how many, I think a couple months now. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been since the Thursday after Labor Day, Nisa, and the team has been really um, careful and patient and thoughtfully engaging with the individuals who are there. And today actually was the day that they kind of stepped up some aspects of the, the enforcement that they were doing. But um, I, I, it's a testament to Ruben's incredible work and the incredible work of the team that almost every single person in the special enforcement zone today um, on 3rd and on Hampton uh, came into voluntary compliance with the city's ADA regulations um, and with the city's implementation of ADA regulations, I should say, and with ingress egress requirements. Um, on, on both of those streets. And, um, you know, I think that it's a testament to the team's excellent work, but it's also a testament to, to the approach that's being taken right now, which is yet. Yeah. You're Dexter, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you off right now, 713. Uh, I, I know you're thanking all these teams, but I wanna move on to our next uh, comment. Eva, could you tell us hey. if you have any comments, concerns? Uh, yeah. I just that we get I just, I I just want to, Soledad, let me say, I just want to make sure that I am actually answering the questions though, please, because, you know, it's it's difficult for me to answer the questions if you're going to cut me off halfway through every right, time. I'm sorry, but, you know, we really need to move on at 713. Um, if you'd like to send me a follow-up email, I can share that with everybody who's participated. We've can I share one questions. thing just before we log off or, or just bef yeah. before we move on? Let's, uh, so let's just I want to I want to just give Helen this these, is, this these is stats the... here. 47 out of 51 locations today at the ABH zone, we were able to get into voluntary compliance. All thank right, you. thank you. Uh, Eva, why don't you go ahead, uh, it's your turn to speak. Yeah, um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I'll come back to it. Uh, I, you know, if the police are still there, uh, I'd like to know what, what laws are in place? Because a lot of people, have been trespassed upon. There's aggressive panhandling, uh, business solicitations by panhandlers, financial institutions, you know, at AT ATMs, at gas stations, you know, in the middle of medians, uh, driveway accessing at shopping centers, like I said, trans uh, gasoline stations, parking lots. And I, I had the understanding that all of these were prohibited by certain chapters in the LA Municipal Code. So can somebody address that or maybe come back next time? Because a lot of the public is not aware uh, that these are on the books unless they are being uh, tamp tamped down because of COVID. I, I don't understand why that would be. But again, we have no trespassing laws. Aggressive panhandling is prohibited. This business solicitations by panhandlers, they're so, they're, they are prohibited, especially at financial institutions, uh, parking lots, public transportation vehicles, gas stations, driveways, medians. So I think we have to really, to help the neighborhood feel safe somehow, to feel that the police are doing their jobs, understand that when something should not be done, that they should call the police. But if the police are going to defer to somebody else, then who should they be calling? Thank you. Right, who's next? Uh, Ellen, is that you? Maybe, but I'll go. Uh, so one of the things, I, I heard a lot of people mention not Lhasa. I, I don't know if Lhasa was invited, but there's a lot of people that, that are either finger pointing, thanking, or asking help from Lhasa. Um, they, I don't believe are actually on the call, which is unfortunate. So, um, if, if they need to be on a call in the future, that would be awesome if we could procure a representative from that organization to, um, either, you know, shine a spotlight on what needs to be done, um, or work with these partners that are on this call today. Um, second of all, Nisa, I, I want to, you know, we talked a lot about the budget, 
um, and how, you know, Michael Bonin is in, in contact with the chiefs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I want to be clear though, that your council member or the, the council member who you work for did actually vote to defund the police, right? So um, as a result of that defunding the police, the LAPD is on this call stating that they don't either have the resources or are lacking the resources um, to actually, you know, help reduce crime, um, help with enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part one of my question. Part two of my question is uh, LAPD, um, I, I did note and I took a note that they did ask for a partnership. Uh, they are seeking partnerships. Um, I, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it sounded like an SOS. Um, and so I, there's a number of people on this call today who are perfectly capable of partnering with the LAPD uh, to either reduce crime um, or help people who are unhoused find housing. So I want to understand from either uh, you specifically, Nisa, um, or the panelists as a whole, what are you doing to work with LAPD, uh, to partner with the LAPD, uh, to increase the quality of life for both the unhoused and housed here in Venice? Do you want me to take this again? Um, yes, our councilman is definitely supportive of the defund fund movement. My point is that so far, their cuts have only been 1%. So if we're talking about the ability to do your job, um, like I mentioned, I am furloughed as well. LA sanitation has been cut as well. Many departments have been cut in the double digits. Um, and so some of those services are lacking, but I think also some people like Ruben um, really do go the extra mile to work with the resources they have. So um, I, I would assume that every department in the city has to try to do the same at this point. Um, I also just wanna make a point that I'm sorry, is a little off topic, but just please remember to report crimes. I, I know that LAPD has asked this as well. Um, sometimes people get frustrated with staying on the line, waiting. Um, when they call, you can do it online. Uh, there is an online reporting uh, portal. Please do that because I've heard from a lot of constituents coming to me, telling me about crime, which is not, it should be going to LAPD. And I ask, have you reported that? And a lot of times they say, no, it took too long to wait. Um, I did not. And just remember that the data of where crime is happening and what you report, as far as I understand, and LAPD can clarify this, if not, that data determines where we need resources. So I just want to put that out there and not forget. 311 for LA sanitation, very important, even though it seems silly. And please make sure that you're reporting crime. And let me let me follow on on this also a little bit, Nisa, because it's true that Councilmember Bonin is in support of reimagining public safety and reimagining public safety means deploying police officers to deal with crimes and deploying police officers not to address things which can be addressed by other public services. And we want the LAPD to be addressing actual crimes and not, you know, doing things like, um, things that should be done by mental health first responders or things that should be done by homeless services providers. You know, and the LAPD, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, LAPD. Guys, I'm sorry, I'm putting mute to this. Thank you, Dexter. Um, it's, it's, I, I. Uh, Ellen, can we, no, I mean, I'm sorry, we have to move on. It's 7.20, uh, thank you for your concerns. We do need to, you know, reimagine public safety. And, you know, uh, Dexter, I would ask your council member to imagine that as well, because uh, all resources are limited, right? We are facing major budgetary cuts to LAPD. I would ask you to work with your council member to figure out if he could reimagine his public salary, because from what I understand, he is making $300,000 a year. <laughs> And I would like for you to work with him and figure out he will take a salary cut to ensure the public health and safety of everyone here. Solidarity. Here, here. No, I'm sorry. I'm he has taken a cut. Let's meet everyone else. He has uh, from here, I'm going to go. Yeah, to Solidad, my this is, this he is has complete. taken a cut. Okay. This is this is completely preposterous. Let's okay. Thank you guys. Uh, I'm sure he's taking a, a major cut. We'll follow up on that. Uh, from here, I want to go to Brian Averill. 
Why don't you ask your questions? From there, we'll go to Mark Ryvek to ask some follow-up uh, follow questions, and then we'll end this. So go ahead, Brian. Sure. This is a question for the uh, the officers. This is more of a just a, a practical thing from sort of being out there. It's pretty obvious that the use of methamphetamine is just going up and up and up and up. Uh, obviously, it's a horribly addictive drug. Um, I don't know if this is a narcotics division thing, but I feel like that's sort of one of the X factors that we don't talk about uh, as far as the violent crime. I feel like folks are a lot more likely to commit violent crime if they're under the influence. So is that something LAPD or narcotics could sort of focus on stemming the, the influx of meth into Venice? Because I think that's something we don't talk about that is sort of a, an underlying factor in a lot of the especially violent stuff that's going on. Thanks. Uh, so bottom line, Brian, the answer is yes. Uh, a lot of the people who engage in violent activity are under the influence of narcotics or they're mentally ill or a combination of both. So uh, yeah, we are doing everything we can to interdict that, that flow of narcotics into Venice. Um, that is one of the causes or one of, one, one of the uh, one of commonalities that we see with the, a lot of the persons experiencing homelessness. Uh, we are receiving help from other divisions throughout the Bureau. I just don't want to be too specific on what details we have, but we have officers coming from our gang and narcotics division. We have officers coming from Hollywood, Wilshire, Olympic, West Los Angeles, cycling through our area. And it's a target rich environment for a narcotics enforcement officer and they are, have been very successful at making arrests. If you noticed, there has been a significant change in the amount or the population and perhaps at Venice. And this started very shortly after the passage of Prop 47. One thing that we all expected that would happen. And what happened with Prop 47 most significantly was the nar harder narcotics was decriminalized. In the past, when we arrested somebody for possession of cocaine, possession of methamphetamine, they would be uh, kept in custody until we went to a preliminary hearing. If this was their first offense, instead of going to jail, they would be offered a diversion. And that diversion would include going through a drug treatment program being on probation for a certain period of time wow. and the NMP tested. Okay. That no longer occurs. Once hard narcotics became decriminalized down to a misdemeanor with zero consequence, there, there's, there's, a, there's no mechanism to, uh, or there's no mechanism to get people off narcotics now. Mm -hmm. So we saw a corresponding increase in that population. Got you. Thank you. All right, Mark, do you want to go ahead, uh, give some wrap up questions and then I can. If, if, if I could. Um, first, I want to thank all of our uh, experts and panelists tonight uh, for joining us and taking so much time to discuss what are very, very important issues for this community. I particularly want to thank the police officers for their patience of sitting there all evening. Um, it's very good of you to take your time with us, but I know that you um, care about this community. Um, I want to ask, I think it's three questions. Um, first of all, uh, Captain, do you agree with Nisa's suggestion that the LAPD is only experiencing a 1% cut? Because I have more of a sense that it's in the 8 to 10% range. Yeah, my math is uh, we wish we only took a 1% cut, but it, it's closer to 8 to 10% because our projected budget, I believe, was $1.6 billion, which sounds like a lot, but uh, we, we did take a $150 million budget reduction for this year, so I wish it was only a, a 1%. Next question is, earlier you um, indicated that there was some partnership that you would like to see with um, Rec and Parks with sanitation, and I, I would suspect also with county mental health and with LASA. Could you walk us through what that would look like? Because it may be the, the roadmap that we as a committee want to work on to both help house the people along the boardwalk, as well as 
return the boardwalk to public use. Okay, Mark, as far as, uh, as, far as the RAP and LASA, I don't think that the issue is partnerships. We've already got great local partners. The, the, the problem that we have in conducting enforcement and cleaning up Venice Beach is a policy issue. And that has to do with the, uh, uh, I think they see enforcement of 6344 differently than we do. Therefore, we do not remove property. We can only engage with people. We require RAP, Rec and Parks to handle the property issues. So until they engage or change their stance on 6344 enforcement, we're not going to see a change in, in, in the property or in the size of the encampments. And, and am I cl clear that the county beaches and harbors, both in Will Rogers Beach, Playa del Rey, and on the sand in Venice, all do provide the support you need to pick up the stuff, right? We don't direct them. Yeah, we, we, we don't direct them. The, the moment police officers become involved in, in, in any property, it becomes a seizure, Fourth Amendment issue. So uh, we refrain from that. But on parks, Reckon Parks takes the lead in that aspect and may direct uh, sanitation. But, but apparently on the sand, mm -hmm. throughout CD11, County Beaches and Harbors is the operative agency. Mm -hmm. And if right. you yeah. arrest somebody, County Beaches and Harbors disagrees with Rec and Parks on the interpretation of CDC guidelines, and they will go and will pick up whatever is there on the sand. That's correct. They have a different uh, interpretation and a different policy. Therefore, so, so how is it the LAPD and the county itself, County Beaches and Harbors, um, has one interpretation, and yet the Rec and Parks Department has the same city attorney that that you do. I, I can't answer that. You can't Different answer department. that. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the conundrum. And I don't know if Mr. Kim would want to come back and say how it is that both his agency and um, the LAPD have the same city attorney and yet they come to a different conclusion about the uh, interpretation of CDC guidelines in relationship to 6344. But I'm, that's a rhetorical question for the moment we can explore. My final question is to Nisa. At an earlier VNC meeting, uh, and first of all, I want to complicate, compliment Nisa. I think, and, I think Nisa actually dropped off. Well, let me raise the question because I think it's a real important question and I'm sorry if she's, she's dropped off. Uh, I want to compliment her and the council member for what they did to relieve the residents in Penmore. Um, and in a follow-up VNC meeting in which she talked about that, she posed the question of what, what's next? And, and I wanna suggest that the next step is, that, is to ask Nisa and the council office to do for the boardwalk with the help of LASA and PATH and St. Joseph, what the council office did to Penmar. And I'm sorry if she's dropped off because that is the next challenge um, for this community to deal both to help the, ha the unhoused, to help the residents, and to help the victims of the crime that are being generated by this huge increase along the boardwalk. And with that, I will. Um, uh, let go of the microphone. Thanks, Mark. Can I, we take a moment? Wanna... Wait. Who's yes, the... Captain. Oh, go ahead, Money. So it's Officer Contreras. So I just wanted to touch on the outreach um, portion of your question. Um, one of the things that LAPD was asking for and did reach out to CD11 was um, in, to improve collaboration between LAPD and outreach in general. Um, just to get the information about who's out there, when are they out there, how can our officers share that with homeless individuals. Um, so we had these meetings um, <coughs> regarding outreach services, we walked to the boardwalk, how can we improve working together. Um, those meetings have since been canceled. Um, so I, I would like to see those meetings start up again. Um, another thing that was also promised was um, community group collaboration, how can we work, community groups work together to address some of the issues on the boardwalk, those meetings, um, I'm still waiting for them to be scheduled. So it is a frustration on our part. Um, we have been asking to, it's not that um, 
you know, LASA isn't answering my emails or phone calls. It's just that the information that we're seeking, the type of outreach, the mental health services, and the collaboration it just isn't happening. So I think our frustration is those meetings got canceled. We'd like to see that start up again so we can at least give um, th that information to our officers. Can, can we be a vehicle to bring LASA, St. Joseph, uh, to a, a Zoom meeting like this with you and your officers um, to, ex to try to strengthen the relationships of the availability of those services to your officers who are actively engaging our homeless population? If we could be sure. Yes, yeah, so, so what we're doing is we are starting to coordinate with them because they cancel these meetings. Um, so I'm hoping um, when I come back from vacation in two weeks to start this up again on the boardwalk and to see what that looks like. Um, we appreciate your support and of course anything um, to improve that collaboration is always welcome. Well, if we can be a vehicle to help, I, I, just, I don't mean to speak for the chair, but I assume that we would be open to helping. Uh, that's right, Mark. And so I wanted to just, you know, reinforce our mission. So our mission is to, uh, it's to recommend ways uh, to advise government agencies on measures to effectively improve stakeholders' safety while promoting a direct departmental to stakeholder collaborative approach, encouraging community-based solutions to address local challenges. So what you just said, that's what we want to do. We want to be the way that you, you know, like interact directly with the community. We want to bring, we, that's what we want to do. We just want to open up, you know, communication directly. And, you know, with that, I want to thank everyone for hanging in with us. Um, and I want to thank you all for, you know, to working with us. This is our first meeting. Uh, you know, I feel like we did, I think we did a good job with like some of our, our Zoom practices. I think people liked our clock. Um, I want to really thank uh, everybody who is here today, all of our policy panelists of experts. Um, I want to thank the LAPD for, you know, staffing us. Uh, I see how many people are in there. Thank you so much. And, you know, just as you are committed to ensuring our safety, we're committed to working with you to make sure that you can do that. And so with that, I want to close the meeting out. Uh, but I want to tell everybody, you know, reach out to us, whoever you are, reach out, send us an email. We want to hear from you. Public safety at VeniceNC.org. You know, let's work together. We can do much more together than we can apart. I want to thank my committee for, you know, I mean, we made this happen. So thank you to everyone. And, you know, let's, let's work together. Let's figure it out. Let's find a way to do this. So with that, you know, have a good night and you know reach out let's let's get some comments let's work together on our next meeting all right good night thank everybody you for it together. Thank you, everyone. thanks everybody Bye. thanks folks